if America's new spacecraft succeeds in reaching Venus, we will have literally reached the stars. be fantastic to win this thing first thing i would do is set up a story a story performances over in greece and i'd like to do it in one of the ancient theaters winning is really important what's even greater is inspiring that's what you do with this show you finally feel as if you made it when you were i don't know maybe being stopped in groceries and airports after appearing on mary hartman mary hartman that's exactly right you've really done your research that's impressive you're, you're sheer nine or ten. You're probably nine and a half. No. Oh. Ten, ten is no one's perfect. But honest to God, you, you're terrific. You do your homework, and I've, I appreciate I've done that. Everybody. I mean, that was fantastic. You are great. The only other person that has that kind of spontaneity and the gift of gab was a late great Chick Hearn. We thought Golden Throat was gone, but he's reincarnated in you. Thank you, Avi. That was. Yeah, I'm, I I agree with all your previous guests, man. You 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 give good intro. Now, if I hear any giggling, a trio of questions no. now more underrated. We have Billy D. Williams, Italian man named Skippy, or Unicycle. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Italian man named Skippy. That they sold the merchandise. They put their own sequels in the movie ahead in of time. The movie, in the movie. Abolish the political parties. I'll tell you this, Al. You, you definitely do your homework. Hey, I, I, like I said, uh, the good thing about you, you're extremely prepared. Don't you ever pull shit like this again. Oh, where'd you get that book from? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> That's my yeah. yeah. You yeah. Guys, I tell you what, you did your homework. Uh, sir, yeah. Could you have fun here in the green room? Anytime you want me back, I'm here, brother. I'm speechless after that. I'm trying to come down from the, the mountaintop. Prince used to say we went to the mountaintop. Well, I'm glad I filmed that, man. I saw everybody else was so hyped on your intros. I figured I better get that <laughs> thing since it was live. How's that? John Amos. Man, what an introduction. I hope I can live up to that. And God bless you. I'm prepared to uh, take on this challenge of this wonderful monologue that you with. And I couldn't think of anything I'd rather do after I read it again for maybe the third or fourth time. I wish that I'd had the time to commit it to memory because it deserves that. Holy cow, what an intro that was. I couldn't say it better than myself. Thank you, my friend. What, a, what an introduction, I'll tell you. It's amazing. I've just been waiting on one of those introductions, and I was sitting there watching the opening of the show, seeing all these guys talk about, oh, man, thank you. That was the greatest introduction we've ever had. And I'm sitting here, I'm saying to myself, please, I'm waiting on him to introduce me. I want to see exactly what they mean, and they didn't lie. Pleasure being here, man. An honor. Whoa, dude. Yo, if I ever need to find somebody, just in general, I am calling you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that great introduction. This is awesome. Avi, thank you, man. That is quite the introduction. I've done a ton of these things, as you know. I've never had an intro like that. Kudos to you, man. It's an honor to be with you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you. That's the best introduction I've ever heard in my life. You know something? You need to quit the show and be my moderator. And travel. <laughs> thank you. You said things about me that I don't even remember. I mean, what a collection of wonderful personalities you have. I think you should write my own book, like the intro. Would you do that again? You're amazing, brother. I was always known as a good talker, but I don't know what the hell to say after listening to you. You're amazing. Thanks, man. That was great. I love the introduction. Yeah, you go with me anywhere and introduce me. I appreciate that. Real. I'll be like, stop moving, moving. <laughs> Sit here with chills as you go and go and go. Whoa, oh, my man. God, from the family. I mean, that was unbelievable. Some of the stuff that you brought up, man, I'm, you know, you bring it back memory. Wow, dude, and that is, <clears throat> amazingly, everything that's happened in my life up till this moment right now. Thank you, Avi, what a pleasure. I don't know what to say after that. Thank you so much. That is the finest rhymed eulogy I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> Thank you, Avi. You definitely have skill, my friend.
I think that you've done a fabulous job and I have not met an interviewer like you. You know, nor neither have I had some of these questions that really sort of went very deep into my heart. Man, I had a ball tonight, man. No lie. I did. I enjoyed it immensely. It really got me thinking and I really got a chance to meet a couple of fantastic guys. <laughs> now, but my hat's off to you. I could have stayed on for hours more. I love different topics. You know, you letting us speak and just reaching other things we never ever spoke about. Dude, absolutely. Oh my God. This was beyond the expectations. Yes, I sir. love you. This is amazing. Did you have fun, man? I really did, Avi. Thank you. I was, it was great. I had a great time. It was great. I mean, your intro for me was just awesome, but also the intro to the show was like, wow, you have all of these people. The only two people I want to beat right now is Rick Barry <laughs> and Eddie Johnson. I'm coming for you. Really good discussion and and the respect and and you you know you're at the center of it all. Oh, I had a blast, man. This was absolutely phenomenal. I hope this takes off even bigger and better. I had a wonderful time, darling. You gave me good eargasm tonight, man. I love your voice. <laughs> I love the things that you talk about, man, and the gift of gab you have. But you're great, my friend. Like I told you, it's almost oh. like you're Chick Hearn reincarnated. It's completely different. I mean, it's not like a podcast at all. I mean, you, the way you talk, you're amazing, brother. Is eargasm a word? It is now. <laughs> <laughs> you have something amazing going with the show because, but you're there and you're educating us. You're taking people from different eras, different disciplines. If you're taking us out of our comfort zone, you're making us fall in love with people that we didn't know. No one will ever ad lib like you. It is amazing though that everyone that comes on, they always say the same thing. How did you know all of that? That is a simply amazing. Oh, that, please. that was one of the best oh. introductions I've ever had in my entire life. Better than my bar mitzvah. Oh man, boy, that was beautiful, boy. Can, can you do it one more time? I, I didn't really hear no, you. That no, well. Can you do it one more? You sure? Not one more time? Jake, welcome, Jake, to the celebrity wow. tournament, my friend. That's that's you, brother. Wow. I I may have had great intros, but I shall never have better. Wow, man. I need to man, you need to go everywhere with me with that intro, man. Holy smokes, Hobby. Where did you get that information from? That's amazing. Uh who is writing your rhymes for you? <laughs> That'll be me. <laughs> You're doing a great job. Thank you for the intro. Thank you, Avi. Wow, that was an incredible introduction. Welcome to the wow. of my friend. Of my face, even when I came on, I'm just like in awe. Avi, thank you very much. That was absolutely beautiful, man. You absolutely brought your A game. Wow, thank you. What an amazing introduction. <laughs> oh my gosh, I am overwhelmed. <laughs> that was that was incredible and exciting. Well, thank you so much for having me. And uh, like so many others in the intro and now, uh, let me applaud your dexterity with the language. Buster Douglas, welcome to the TKN Celebrity Tournament, my friend. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was awesome. The greatest wealth is when you can share it with someone. You can share your victories. You can share your failure. You can express your deepest feelings. Thank you, Avi. And, and if I could say something to you. Yes, you know, I've been through a really rough time the last month, and I really thank your support. I, I lost my father, and you, you were the first person to support me in all that, and I thank you so much for that. It meant a lot to me. Did you find the technique itself helpful when it came to observing your scene partner staying present instead of strictly relying upon memory? That's a great question, Avi. Ralph Cramden, the yoga instructor, or Don Corleone, the computer repair person? <laughs> 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 I really enjoyed this, man. You're, you're a smart guy, and you ask really good questions. And Last name, Mantegna. First name, Joe. Joe, welcome, <laughs> my friend. I think I have whiplash, Avi. Thank you no, very no, much. No. Well, thank you very much. Oh! Thank you so much, Avi. Good to be back. What a hell of an introduction. That was cool, man. I don't even think Michael Buffett did it better than you, brother. <laughs> thank you, Avi. What, a, what an introduction. That that was very impressive. Stretch! Yo, that was dope. I you better than a lot of these rappers out there. <laughs> See, I stand in awe of your memory and your ability to rhyme, and it's just amazing. What an incredible introduction, Avi. That is probably the best introduction I've ever had. <laughs> Brother, I'll, I'm going to take you with me everywhere to get an introduction. <laughs> That's the best introduction I've ever had in my life. 
I, I am so happy to be on this show. I hope you didn't mind that I filmed that intro you just did for me because I'm going to play that on my low self-esteem day. Jake Roberts, my friend. Wow, that was scary. Welcome, Julie Brown. <laughs> Thank you, Avi. That was mind blowing. I love this. This is great. You got the intro down to a science, baby. That was, that was great. Here and great to be back interviewed by you. It's been far too long. Happy New Year. Oh, you are so wonderful. Happy New Year to you. I am so grateful for our friendship. You appreciate things in people that make such a difference. You're quite wonderful. It's brilliant. You made, you made me laugh, too. It was great. I think ALF would be wisecracking while the alien would be tearing everybody up apart, I guess. Like, uh, Let's talk about some, I guess, some of the 80s horror class. Hey, welcome, my friend. Well, thank you for having me. I, and I'm excited about it. All of the, the actors and directors of the worlds come together. This is like a sanctuary for those people because we don't always get to talk about the things that really, truly move us. I love this show because it makes me feel. This is different. I don't even know where you come up with these questions. You're so innovative. I, like, I love it, man, because it got me thinking. Man, this is beautiful. This is when you got a hangover, you can have some of these. I've had a 32 year hangover watching the Knicks. <laughs> Welcome to the green room. How did you do that thing where you were talking so fast? I don't know. I, I, very few people can do what you did. Well, um, the acting teacher here, 35 years, commends you on your ability to do that. I'm very impressed. Man, I had a ball tonight. Nobody do it like my boy Avi. I had a good. This is fantastic. I mean, this gets your juices. Oh. You know, it gets you thinking. Thank you. We had fun. You know, it's fun and it is education. It was intellectually stimulating, which is a unique thing in, in this world of ours today. I had a fabulous time. Thanks for having me on the show. And Avi, great job. This is oh. interesting and different. Question, did you have a good time, my friend, tonight? I did. But it's so unusual to be engaged in what everybody else is saying. It was awesome. It was really great. I want to compliment you on giving me my best introduction I've ever had in my whole life, too. That's really uh, the first thing. Thank you. And I really enjoyed every minute of it, man. Thank you so much for having me, and I'm just happy I made it to the next round. Yeah, I had a great time. It was wonderful. I mean, it was so thought-provoking. And, and you, Avi, I have a great deal of respect for your uh, resume as well. I, I mean, I've done many interviews over the years, but this has been one of the most fun by far. Well, thank you very much. I can't think of a better way to begin the new year. Then oh, with you. Did you have fun tonight, my friend? Yes, I did. Yes. Looking, uh, looking for a lot of people are willing and open. I like that. I, I did have a good time. It was a lot, lot different than what I thought it was going to be, and I really enjoyed it. I appreciate you, and I appreciate the opportunity. Like Barry, I didn't know what to expect. We done. I enjoyed it. It's good to be able to to see that. You bring people together that, you know what, maybe one of the world's problems will get solved by listening to this show. And I want you to accept the accolades that you get from all of these brilliant people. They tell you that you're smart. They tell you that you're exposed. These are comments and compliments that you have to say, thank you very much, I accept. Wasn't sure what to expect. You're number one in my book as far as putting on a podcast, knowing what, what you know. Yeah, I had a really, uh, we had a really nice time, and uh, you're terrific. Yeah. Uh and I've never done something like this before. You know what? You're, you're a very interesting person. I mean, uh, you are, you, 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 with all this rhyming stuff, you must really put a lot of effort into this. And uh, I, I, I would love to read or see something that you've written. Read it in why? Sauerkraut, Henry Kissinger's deep soothing voice, or dogs wearing sweaters? I like dogs wearing sweaters. Wait, is teaching this craft as rewarding for you as performing? I think sometimes it's more rewarding. Where did you do your research? I'm very impressed. Yeah, I had a lot of fun. You do a great job preparing. A very simple formula. Everybody's a suspect. I hope you're getting paid a lot. <laughs> that was the greatest <laughs> intro I think I've ever had. The amount of stuff that you talk about that I don't even remember about myself. So impressive that I highly am. So I would Thank give you, this man. a very high A. But it was like a high school reunion. It's terrific and it's fun and, and keep bringing diverse personalities together. I think that's great. And it's also wonderful to hear people talk sanely to each other today. This is, I, mean, this, I think, my time. I think when you do the intro you gave me, I kind of give it to you. I like you deserve it. Later on, you were able to get her cast on a series and she received her sad card. Oh. That you brought that up. I can't tell you how refreshing it is that somebody knows what they're doing. I had a blast. This is a great show. What a blast. We, I had a great time uh, tonight. Did you keep rhyming, man? Like I said, it gave like a battle rap spoken word. <laughs> you know, usually I'll do interviews and get asked the same questions about Stephen King. This was great to talk about things that matter that go beyond project. Last name Johnson, first name Eddie. 
Wow. When I have a retirement party, even at my funeral, you better show up. Oh. <laughs> Papa Smurf as a hip hop artist? Yo. <laughs> yeah. You're very talented. That's amazing. Mr. Sizemore, first name Tom. How are you, my friend? <laughs> So I could turn the volume lower if you'd like next time, if you'd like me to do that. I don't know what I can do now. First name, Keith. Oh my God, what a great introduction. Fantastic. You do your uh, research. Connected with me right there. And he knows my brand. This is why your audiences love you. This uh, is why you continue to great guests. And great guests beget, beget great guests. I enjoy myself so much. Oh, man. I had a blast. I didn't know what to expect. The meeting, meeting Joe, and uh, it, was, uh, it was just, it yeah. was, we just had a phenomenal time, everyone. Yes, it really was a great experience, a very unique, something that I've never really done. I had a lot of fun. I mean, this is fantastic, man. You do a great job. Abby and the professionalism oh, of the voice, a breath of fresh air. I love the questions. Honestly, like that perspective Appreciate in life it. is what I think we all need to think about. Hey, listen, brother, it was so much fun. I'm so glad I'm moving on to the next round. I did. Fantastic time, man. I, I, again, the questions, uh, the competition. Avi, you do an amazing job. I appreciate you and appreciate this format. Again, you do a lot of virtuals. You had a nice time tonight, Nicky James? I had a great time. I'm Very happy well. about that. I actually had a great time. I got a great chance to get to know the other two contestants. I'm going to hook them up on social media. I had a great time. And if I go up against uh, Jimmy McMahon, can we do it in the same room together? I got to tell you, John, you do a lot of these, man. Did you have fun tonight, my friend? I really enjoyed myself. Thank you. Yeah, it was great. But you showed us your heart and soul, and I appreciate that. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I really do love what you're doing, and it's, it's, you. it's so different and unique. I respect you a ton. Can't wait to talk to you soon and work with you as well. It's like Saturday Night Live all over again. You have accomplished something that is absolutely amazing. You're you're. It's amazing. There's no words to describe what you are doing. You are getting the best out of everybody, out of every discipline, every, and you're putting it out there and sharing it with everybody that, you know what? Your show should be in every school. They should listen because you bring, you bring good values. You bring the, you, the, it's amazing what you're doing, Abby. And, I, and you know, everybody's telling you, but take it from me. What you are doing is educating. It's the world is a better world, is a better place thanks to you. Guys and gals and pals, here we are. It is Saturday night and we are ready to have some fun, are we not? If you're a fan of fiery, unbridled passion, that end intro says it all as it can melt the South Pole. This place we call the green room is filled with edutainment, and it has plenty of heart and soul. It's time I listen to Stanislavski and take a beat as I process everything in real time. This is the 181st consecutive episode of the green room, a feeling that cannot be expressed through a mere rhyme. With a bevy of views on 53 plus pages week in and week out, innovation is our name and the sweat is the sweet. Dedication, labor, and innovation only arrive when your effort is absolute. Put that in a tweet. And in this celebrity tournament that's captivated the masses, the field is one of a kind. Luminaries from all walks of life gather in to compete for the pride and the prize. This is truly a sport of the mind. Sure, the numbers are fantastic on 53 pages, not including my own. But what's even sweeter is the sweat. By that, I mean good old-fashioned work ethic, wholehearted passion, effort, and consistency never lead to regret. The good bard Mr. Shakespeare himself said our doubts are traitors and make us lose the good we oft might win by fearing to. And those words ring oh so true. It means that you are the author of your story. Don't edit your vision due to others that secretly prefer to boo while attempting to obstruct your view. With 13 grand and a trip for Greece and becoming the first champion of the stars of the field, a lot is on the line. But you are audience, the engine that makes this thing go, are the sweet nectar that we appreciate like fine old wine. As strangers become friends and we all come together, let's remember that we are closer than one might surmise. Limitless visions of innovative bliss experienced by an ensemble is the vision behind these eyes. Never hate the flower for starting out as a seed. Long distance running is essential. This isn't a stampede in life, so don't run any rover on your way to the top. Focus on yourself and never forget to cheer lead. Root for your loved ones and lift people up. This human fortune cookie hopes that we have all agreed that positivity is something that we can never concede. So with that, guys and gals and pals, let me bring in our first participant right now, guys. Uh, an absolute legend. This is quite the night. These three luminaries represent the good in humanity, the decency, 
And of course, what they've done, all three of them, what they've done to excel in their craft, in their chosen vocation, leaves me speechless. But guys, I'm not speechless when I'm about to bring in our first participant right now. When I think of him, I think of the following. The aim of life is to live. And to live means to be aware, joyously, serenely, divinely aware. Life is a song. Sing it. Life is a game. Play it. Life is a challenge. Meet it. Life is a dream. Realize it. Life is a sacrifice. Offer it. Life is love. Enjoy it. The latter rings true when beginning to describe my next guest. His ambition coupled with limitless talent has been on full display for the masses to observe. His work epitomizes the unselfish collaboration as he's created such great harmony with fellow colleagues and teammates. He's a remarkable and fascinating human being with layers of depth going several orders of magnitude deep. And he shared that intimate understanding of the self with a public audience. He was born to parents Dolores and Ferguson. The latter grew up in Windsor, Ontario years before his son's life became storybook. His father was born in 1909, moved to Chatham in the mid-30s when the world was shook. And he worked for the William Pitt Hotel as a cook. His father had a brother named Cyril. He left a box. He worked on the Great Lake Liners and was quite the shield to which his team never appealed when he played center field. When our first guest was born, his mother lost most of her sight in childbirth. She was supported, motivational, and positive, a true rarity walking on planet Earth. Like every other boy in Chatham, he was a defenseman that played hockey. His dream was to be in the NHL Hall of Fame, just like superstar Doug Harvey. He also played basketball, and he became a star at Chatham Vocational Schools in 61 and 62, as his opponents would feel rather blue, oh, it's true, like a lyric from Muddy Waters. Can you imagine the following? He spent part of two winters in the 60s touring with the Harlem Globe Trotters. That's right, despite becoming a Hall of Fame pitcher, baseball was actually his third choice. Watching him live, many would rejoice and express their limitless elation by using their voice. You know who loved watching him play? My second cousin from my father's side, known as Joyce. As a child, he owned his control by throwing rocks down the ice chutes of a neighborhood cool coal yard and through the doors of moving box cars. His maturation coincided with a terrible time of discrimination, so he definitely has his scars. Initially, he was a first baseman as his dad got him into playing the infield. He hit him with pop-ups and ground balls and would finally pitch in the winter of 58. His English teacher in Chatham, Jerry McCaffrey, watched him play and realized that he would one day be great. Sometimes the hands of destiny need to coax what eventually becomes our fate. So if you're attempting to cross home plate when he was pitching, you might have a better chance of seeing the Loch Ness Monster skate or a sleepy Buddhist monk debate. Gene, the Philadelphia Philly scout, began meeting him throughout the winter at a local gymnasium and became very instrumental in the young ball player's life. He helped usher in hope and positivity while eliminating any potential or backlash or even strife. One of the great baseball scouts in history, Tony Lucadello, signed him, and soon he would make history. In 65, the Phillies offered him 7,500, and the world would witness his talents. There would be no mystery. He has broken and held records and has done the unthinkable. Watching him ascend to greatness was a treat, as his talents were as rare as observing a tap-dancing vegetarian alligator from the Everglades. It is now time for me to list a myriad of his accomplishments and accolades. He achieved a monumental feat in posting Six straight 20-win seasons. Winner of the 71 Cy Young Award. Sporting News Pitcher of the Year. Comeback Player of the Year. Member of the Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame. And the almost impossible to enter National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. His number 31 was retired by the Chicago Cubs. And he was also a three-time National League All-Star. So it's time to welcome him in. As you park your car, no need to wish upon a star. We rooted for him at home with a family or with friends who are at the bar. He's multifaceted like a panel of guests appearing on Bill Maher. Do you feel the suspense? It's time to get happy, so smile, cheer, or grin as I bring in an absolute legend, champion, and Hall of Famer. Last name Jenkins, first name Ferguson. Ferguson Jenkins, welcome to TKN. Hey, Javi. Beautiful. Great entree. I mean, that's an incredible. You did your homework. I don't think you missed... Uh, a beat of all the things that uh, I had an opportunity to achieve and friends that were part of my life that got me to basically where success has been, 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 been fabulous, incredible. And you've given it back too, because, you know, reading the chapter of your life and really doing my due diligence, I realized how much you've done for so many people and you're bashful and you won't bring it up, but I will throughout this program. And I have to tell you this real quick, Ferguson. I mean, when I looked at some of your accomplishment accolades, I realized I needed new eyeglasses because there's so many. 
I mean, there's a bevy of accolades and accomplishments that you have. Uh, it, it was great to pour through all of that. But as a humanitarian, I salute you and I thank you for what you've done for many people in society. Thank you. Yeah, I started a foundation about almost 24 years ago. Yeah. And uh, it had the opportunity with the foundation to do Special Olympics, uh, CNIB, Canadian Institute for the Blind, Cancer Research, uh, the Homeless. So there's so many facets of, of charities that uh, I've had an opportunity to have my fingerprint on or my, I, I guess it'd be a thumbprint. <laughs> right. Of having that uh, opportunity to be a, to be one of those individuals that stepped forward and had an opportunity to do those great things. Man, and you have, my friend. And I cannot wait for tonight to be yet another legendary night with you. Uh, I'm going to put you backstage momentarily and bring in our second participant. Beautiful. Ferguson Jenkins, guys, an absolute legend extraordinaire. I want to bring in our second participant as well because in, in the conversations we've had, I, I feel like I've known him for a long time. He's really a down-earth human being, uh, not to mention a funny man, uh, a talented man, a man who's been on Broadway, and more on that in the intro. And when I think of him, I think of the following. Craftsmanship. Without craftsmanship, inspiration is a mere reed shaken in the wind. The larger the island of knowledge, the longer the shoreline of wonder. The human race has only one really effective weapon after all, and that's laughter. And my next guest is a man that is as multifaceted as he's talented. He's provided many smiles and laughs onto the masses, and he's also inspired many. He's taken a once blank canvas and filled it up with works of art, and we marvel that his truthful and honest work on screen as a storyteller. His range and depth are quite vast, and his outlook rather refreshing. He's a remarkable and positive human being that has bestowed upon all of us his limitless gifts time and again. He was born to Harold and Barbara, and his paternal grandfather left Romania in 1914 at a time in which they were neutral in World War I way back when. After arriving at Ellis Island, his name was changed several times, which was rather common back then. He grew up in Tarzana, a suburban neighborhood of Los Angeles, the son of an opera-loving doctor who enjoyed music that was quite classical. Years later, our guest did something magical, as he performed three times at Carnegie Hall, as his resume is quite diverse and theatrical. His great performances, Ira Gershwin at 100, and National Anthem at the U.S. Open and Dodger Stadium only begin to tell the tale of a man that would always captivate and enthrall. He also sang with English rock star Robbie Williams at the legendary Royal Albert Hall. As a boy, he was convinced he would be a baseball player or a movie star before he inspired comedians like Jimmy Fallon. He wanted to do musicals, and he was seven, and then wanted to be a comedian like Woody Allen. He watched Take the Money and Run when he was 13, and soon he would be on the scene. Taking his beautiful works of art would always make one feel serene, even though we laughed so hard that in the interim, we might have damaged our spleen. He attended UCI as a drama major from 75 to 79. And even though he would uh, do Lenny Bruce routines in his dorm, he inspired many like this writer, Avi Klein. In 79, he wrote a short story and he was doing something called Solar Energy. And there in college, he met Robin Williams, who wanted to be introduced as Nikki Lenin. He proceeded to rock the place for 45 minutes and much to no one's chagrin, the man was brilliant and the mere thought of these two comedic legends in the same room is enough to make me grin. Studying acting with Tony Barr at the Film Actors Workshop, the latter suggested he focus solely on comedy. He played everything honest, whether it was slapstick or a Greek tragedy. He began taking classes with the famous improv comedy troupe The Groundlings in 1982. One year later, after being accepted into the Sunday Company as his toolbox blossomed and grew, on March 28, 85, The Groundlings appeared on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, where he premiered his character, Tommy Flan, again. Soon thereafter, his career would reach incredible heights, taller than a Frankenstein played by Fred Gwynn. That's right, at the height of his glory, he told many a story as his career would continue to thrive. We're talking about becoming one of the lead stars on the legendary show Saturday Night Live. Less than 1% even receive an audition to SNL, but this man was nominated not once but twice for an Emmy. He filled our hearts with joy and hope, not to mention laughter and endless glee. He appeared on Broadway at the Music Box Theater and Neil Simon's play The Dinner Party, taking over the lead role from Henry Winkler. He had stage presence and authority like an in his prime Raymond Burr. He was also the first big name guest on the show Friends, and he received another Emmy nomination. Anytime he graced us with his presence on the big or small screen, it was cause for a celebration. Hot in Cleveland, Las Vegas, Two and a Half Men, Hawaii Five O, New Girl, just some of the roles he starred in on TV. He also appeared in 12 episodes of The Simpsons, which we would all see as he created the character of Marge Simpson's boyfriend, Artie Ziff, who sounded like another iconic character in TV history. 
He was the lead voice for the character Jay Sherman in the acclaimed cult cartoon series The Critic. And who can forget his iconic SNL characters, such as The Devil, Master Thespian, Hanukkah Harry, and others that gave many characters fits. He could even make the classy sorts spit out their water as they were dining at the Ritz. His barrage of comedy is like a football blitz. According to 14 major publications, he's in the top seven of all-time greats on SNL. He had substance that goes beyond the glitz. So put your hands together for a man that is truly one of a kind and one of the greats. First name John, last name Lovitz. Welcome, John Lovitz, to TKN, my friend. Thank you. Let <laughs> me you put glitz and Lovitz. <laughs> a marvelous intro. Thank you very much. Oh, you deserve every bit of it, my friend. You too. Man, oh man, John, I got to tell you, you know, a lot of people were asking me, they said, wow, you know, I was sending them a, a, a different tidbits about your career. And one of the things they were fascinated with was Broadway. That must have been something that you were really, really proud to be a part of, because being a thespian when you were young was something that you were focused on, even though you were a fan of comedy as well. Yeah, it was a Neil Simon play. And what was amazing was um, I ended up rehearsing for three weeks. Right with Neil Simon, just the two of us. And he had an office in the Westwood in Los Angeles and just the, the two of us rehearsing. And then it was a, the, the play starred um, Henry Winkler and John Ritter, and they did it for nine months and then they were leaving. So I suggested uh, the great comic Larry Miller play opposite oh. me. And so Neil said, well, I got to hear him, you know, read the play. So, so I told Larry, he was all excited. So we read the whole play out loud and then neil simon just started talking and he didn't say anything so i was like well about larry did he does he have the part he goes of course he has the part i'm like oh he didn't say anything like, <laughs> larry, larry and i had a great time doing it it was he's it was such fun. a great guy too uh you know he was so there was a talk of a sequel of necessary roughness he was in that movie with scott Bakula, and my literary agent asked me if i would want to be part of a writer's room this was years back when they were pitching the sequel and larry miller uh who they had contacted they had all mentioned how they were intimidated by Larry, not because of anything other than the fact that he's such a genius, uh, but he he riffed a, with a couple of comedians that he would love to have been a part of the film. Your name came up. Um, it, it's so great to know how much respect you have from your peers. That's my point. And I just really want uh, to tell you that as a human being, you have my respect as well, my friend. Yeah, thank you. Well, I you said I influenced you, so you that's did. a big compliment. I, I good appreciate to do this show, I imagine. Thank you so much. That means the world to me, man. Uh, and guys, again, uh, thanking the studio, thanking all our views, six figure across the board. Thanks to luminaries like John Lovitz, Ferguson Jenkins, and my next guest, uh, Mr. Lovitz. I'll put you backstage for a moment. Okay. Thank you, my friend. And guys, we're going to get started with the topics once I bring in our third guest tonight, who I am. I am in awe of, and I want her to to hear that. I am in awe of everything that <laughs> that she has done and everything she does, and this next chapter of her life. God almighty, guys, uh, she's really inspired and done so much for so many people and given uh, a lot of good to the world. So when I think of the word good, it isn't always about being good, but rather releasing good. And she has done just that. Good deeds have their own reflection. Such kind people leave a legacy in their hearts and the hearts of others. And that cannot ever be forgotten. When it comes to my next guest, she's truly unforgettable. She has fought for those that had no voice or platform and she did it with such gusto that even a pugilist would have been burnt out. Talent is one thing. Character is another altogether. Her character and dignity epitomize the true essence of humanity at its best. Born in Pennsylvania, she was raised in Westchester County, New York, until the age of 12. She would always champion important causes, as they would never sit on some shelf. The family relocated to San Juan, Puerto Rico, as her father Jesse was in the rum exporting business, and her mother Zelda ran an art gallery. She had a mastery in the way of human connection, regardless of the salary. She studied acting under the tutelage of Sanford Meisner, who placed emphasis on personal experiences that can, through honest and truthful storytelling, go past our insecurities and fears. His teachings were an inspiration to my own mirror method that I've been developing for over 12 years. She earned a bachelor's degree from the brand new broadcasting department at Columbia University, where she was one of only two women in the program. Her commitment to excellence is as pure as a smile from old Richie Cunningham. And her heart is as large as any skyscraper or even a certain palace named Buckingham. She got her first real full-time radio job in Puerto Rico on WHOA around 1956 as her career would soon grow. She was the first morning person five days a week and back then was paid only $2 a show. It was very good training and it was very unusual because there were no women in radio at that time. 
Being in Puerto Rico allowed her to be on the air prior to her prime, and her positive impact on society cannot be expressed even here three, through a mere rhyme. She got her first television show in the late 50s, also in Puerto Rico, and the cameras were huge, while the lights, oh yes, back then, were so very, very hot. Get up to 120 degrees under television lights in those days, like an interrogation scene in a film noir plot. Imagine wearing thick brown makeup all over your face, hotter than any average kitchen restaurant. She was the only woman on the show which was called What Do Men Want? She was comfortable on camera right away, as her mother was a dancer and her grandmother was on a radio. She grew up as a third-generation woman in show business, but her ascension wasn't simply presto. Even though she was an aficionado, she would help many people today and even tomorrow. In the early 70s, she got a job as the night person at WIOD, Wonderful Isle of Dreams Radio, in Miami. The following luminaries that we'll mention were regulars on the show, which is quite uncanny. Picture this. You're hanging out with Jackie Gleason. You're playing pool with Minnesota Fats. Then in walks Tennessee Williams, an absolute legend that wore many different hats. She worked for AP International, and she was sent to President Papa Doc in Haiti during the time of the paramilitary force, which terrorized the nation. Want to talk about an atmosphere void of elation? They said, be careful. The room is bugged. Can you imagine the frustration? Yet she pers persevered and continued to do works of good regardless of the station or the administration. We, the public, always expressed our appreciation as she has always bettered our society and also civilization. We felt a sense of exhilaration through her honesty. She always preferred radio, by the way, as radio has the theater of the imagination. She was in New York looking for a job after WPIX. She and her husband, Carl, owned a restaurant on First Avenue, the Wine Press. But I, before I digress, can you imagine the vice president of NBC Radio coming out there for dinner? Asking him for a job and hoping for a yes? She was working all night on radio answering questions as the ratings began to climb. At its high point, she was on 120% of America as I continued to drop this dime. The show became exceedingly popular as she was on two stations at the same time. She was a trailblazer, the first woman to host a syndicated talk show on TV before Oprah Winfrey arrived on the scene. She raised awareness on so many important issues that were once unseen, domestic issues, AIDS, and when she hugged a beautiful soul like Ryan White, it was apparent that she was more valuable than any queen. She was named the best radio and television host of all time by no less than nine major publications. In 89, she won an Emmy Award and received many other nominations. She's an accomplished painter and has showcased her artwork in various galleries and exhibitions, yet she has always remained down to earth and the same. In 93, she was honored with a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. So please stand up. Right now, and applaud a legend, pioneer, an incredible human being. Whether you're in Philly or Cali, let's usher in the positivity as we rally and welcome a one of a kind, beautiful soul. Last name Raphael, first name Sally. Sally, welcome to TKM, my friend. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, my dear, my dear, my dear. What an intro. Wow. Oh, I, I salute you for, for everything you represent, my friend. Everything. Boy, you do your homework. Whoa. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate that. You know, I didn't even know some of that. <laughs> Gosh almighty. Man, uh, Sally, I have to tell you, because I've mentioned this briefly when we spoke uh, earlier, you've inspired people like my parents. Uh, you've inspired people, of course, from all walks of life. And yet you continue to do so. And I love that you're not apologetic about standing up for people that don't have a voice, and I respect you and honor you for that. Thank you very much. That's very kind. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, Sally, before I bring in everybody, John and Ferguson, I have to ask you this as well. I mean, when it comes to uh, the arts and the craft of storytelling, that was such a big passion of yours. Uh, well, if you have to fill seven hours at night from... Well, nine to one and then 12 to seven, uh, you got to tell stories. Yes, yes. <laughs> and you certainly told them really well and on stage as well. Uh, guys and gals and pals, no one's in a box. These luminaries, again, they're here live and we need to give them our appreciation for giving us their time. So with that, Mr. Ferguson Jenkins, Mr. John Lovitz, can't wait to, to be able to delve into these topics. And John Ferguson and Sally, I'm glad we all got a chance to schmooze before the show as well. Yeah, uh, beautiful. Please. Absolutely. Uh, I, I want to bring in topic number one. Guys, you, you might be seeing some free-flowing conversation as well after, after the first topics. Uh, the first topic is something I call crossroads because there's a strange comfort in knowing that no matter what happens today, the sun can rise again tomorrow. There's a strange comfort in knowing that even though you might feel strange, indecisions might make you feel stranger, feeling unsure which way to turn. We might ask ourselves, why do these decisions never seem to get any easier? So guys and gals and pals, 
Crossroads. This is topic number one, which I'll ask John Lovitz first. The question is, since there are many different times in our lives when we can find ourselves at a crossroads and feel unsure which way to turn, John, can you please share a moment in your life where you were at a crossroads and might have felt stuck? Were there many options, well-intentioned paths on the horizon? The floor is yours, my friend, whenever you are ready, good sir. Oh, okay. Well, I, yeah, there were actually two. The first was, um, you know, I I, I started uh, doing, wanted to be an actor. Well, I, from 7 to 15, I wanted to be Willie Mays. <clears throat> and I literally, you know, you're a kid, I wanted to be an African-American baseball player. And then when I was 15, what? I went, oh, crap, I'm not black. And it really didn't hit me. Willie uh, Mays was like, <laughs> like Michael Jordan in basketball. I mean, he was, you know, I'm sure Ferguson and I like I did. He was like God. He, when I was 12, my dad said, There's more to life than Willie Mays. And I remember looking at him thinking, uh, no, there isn't. And um, but anyway, it was really hard to give up that passion for baseball. I just I wasn't nowhere near good enough. <laughs> no forget it but but i loved it to death but i so anyway i i stopped and i got, and then i got into acting and i did plays in high school then i was a drama major at uc irvine for four years and i was like at college i did like 21 plays and i did was there from 10 to midnight and anyway then after college i was trying to make it and i and i was a uh, you'd see people it's really hard to do it it's it's not like um i mean i think well, obviously, what you guys do is is extremely tough. In acting, though, there's not a there's no stats. It's just people's you know feeling, and so it's hard to prove yourself. So anyway, I was 26. I'd been at it for you know, see, 11 years, and trying to get myself good enough to work. And it, it, and I was um, a messenger. I had one job for two weeks in that whole time on this show, The Paper Chase. And that was it. So I was 26 and I was sitting outside my apartment and a preacher came on. Uh, this was in the radio and the preacher, Southern guy said, well, you know, people say they want to be rich and famous, but uh, ask yourself, are you willing to do what you have to do to get what you want? And he said it again. So I thought, am I willing to do what I have to do to get what I want? And it was like looking down a big black tunnel with no light at the end. I didn't have an agent. I didn't have anything. And I just thought, no. It, it just seemed impossible. So that night I thought I was, I go, I give up. I just can't do it. And you'd see a lot of people would try it for years. They go, I can't try anymore. And it was un, because you're, you're paying to act. You're not getting anything. You just in return. And so I, I said, okay, I'm quitting. And then the next morning I woke up in the morning and I just slammed my fist on my pillow. I go, I don't want to quit. And then I thought, well, you better get your ass in gear. And then, all right, what do I have to do? And I thought about it and I was like, oh my God. And then it was like, but I just, I gave up everything. I didn't go to a restaurant. I didn't do anything, but I had a job as a messenger and I would practice that in my cards, doing voices and speeches. And then I was in the Groundlings Sunday company and I'd spend the other eight hours a day rehearsing and writing. And then three years later, things started happening. And that's when I got Saturday Night Live and everything else. And then, <clears throat> so, and then that went along. And then the next, oh, actually, I guess the next time was I was 46, 20 years later, and I'd been working a lot, but not the last seven years, I hadn't gotten any, hardly any movies. And I said to my agent and manager, can you guys get me work? I go, I'm not broke, but I'm going to run out of money in five years. And they both said, well, why don't you sell your house? I was like, what? Like, and my, I said to my manager, You're, he was building a mansion and my agent had just bought a mansion and I'm like, well, they're going up and I'm just going down. So I did not want to go. I go, if I stay with them, I'll be broke. So then I had a, a choice to make. What am I going to do? Cause they're not getting me any acting work. And that's when I decided, uh, I got to do something different, but I decided to become a stand-up comedian and, um, and then fired both of them. And then I worked at that for, to learning how to do it for a couple of years. And it was something that I always wanted to do, but I would get up on stage and my heart was pounding through my chest. I was so nervous. And, uh, but I, I did it and, um, and I've been doing stand up now for the last 20 years. So it was, it was a good thing in a way because it was that fear of like, if I don't, 
if you don't help yourself out of a situation, no, no one else is going to. And I, it, it forced me to do something I always wanted to do, but I was t too afraid to do it. And it was more really about not wanting to go back, you know, living after college. I was like, I was on my own and my, and my father said, you know, he's a very successful doctor, but he goes after college, you're on your own. And I actually thanked him because I made like five bucks an hour. I lived on $800 a month, less tax was so $600 a month. I lived on for seven years. So it really forced me if I don't get my act together, this is how I'm going to be living, you know? And, um, so those two things impelled me to do what I had to do to get what I want. So I guess I should thank my agent manager <laughs> for, for basically just giving up. And then you just have to rely on yourself. But I, I, I did it. And then I feel like telling people, believe me, if I can do it, you can. I mean, it's, it's just more determination and, and uh, trying to get better and better. But it, it's tough. And uh, anyway, that's that's my answer to that question. Sure. Um, I want to ask John this question and, and Ferguson and Sally as well. When I teach the craft, I talk about the mo moment before. There's always something that our characters have, the moment before. We, we don't become characters. We get to know them since we're in the driver's seat as storytellers. John, was was the moment before your first moment on stage doing stand-up the most difficult, the moment before? It was for years because I would try it and my heart would just start racing. And I'd say to someone, put your hand on my chest. And they and they go like this. They go, oh, my God. I mean, it was like boom, 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 boom. I mean, it was just like I just sprinted. Well, Ferguson would have had to run, you know, 10 miles. Me, it was if I sprinted 10 feet. <laughs> Oh, well, you know, it's, it, it, that's, and, yeah. But yeah, it was very nerve wracking. But I have to say, I did meet Ferguson Jenkins. My friend Casey Sanders, an actor, and he was in the minor leagues. And I met Ferguson Jenkins at the, it's a, called the Major League Baseball Players Association. And it's, they have a game, had a game in St. Petersburg. And my friend Casey got me in it. So I got to live both my dreams because I got to be an actor and then I got to be on a baseball field with people like Ferguson Jenkins and Goose Gossage and Bob Feller and Pete Rose there and, and uh, Tim McGraw who was great. So I, I ended up, I didn't make a living as a baseball player, but I still got to play with pro baseball players. And I have to tell Ferguson, who was very nice, those those games, I, I was like a 10-year-old kid again. Being on the field with those guys was such a thrill. It was like oh, I'm in the big leagues, you know. And I'm playing with the big leaguers, and it was it was incredible. And also, uh, part of one of the most iconic baseball films of all time, A League of Their Own. Uh, you are you're on that set as well, uh, guys and gals and pals. This is Sally, Jesse, Raphael, John Lovitz, and Ferguson Jenkins. Uh, gosh Almighty, we're learning a lot about who these luminaries are as we go deep here. Uh, it, it's it's quite the month for this because. One of the people I still consider a dear friend who I communicate with is Diane Nash. She's one of the original Freedom Riders. And when I taught history, I wasn't allowed to talk about the Buffalo Soldiers. I wasn't allowed to talk about Freedom Riders. Diane Nash. So when we talk about women, we talk about why we should celebrate a lot of the women today that do so much for society. We don't give them a voice as much as we possibly can unless it's a holiday, unless it comes with an asterisk. So I ask Sally the question. We're in the 21st century, Sally, of course, but are the great women of the 20th century being neglected overall as pioneers and revolutionary forces in our society, past and present? Your thoughts, my friend. Well, <laughs> if you look at the opening of the show that we just saw, the men outnumbered the women yep. 30 to 1 on your own opening. Men have always endeavored to keep women from enjoying the equality that they would have if they um, made their, if they had their own incompetence. Do you understand what I'm saying? Absolutely. Yeah, when you, when women are saying, I want equality, we haven't had the equality to be incompetent like men have had the equality to be incompetent. Now, um, 
you're talking a lot about sports, and I saw a lot of sports figures. I play catcher with the St. Louis Cardinals when I was in St. Louis. So aside from that, the only thing that I know that I haven't done in broadcasting is sports. I don't understand it, and it's not something that I've been very interested in. <laughs> Do you, do you feel like right now? Oh, wait. Yeah. Maybe I haven't answered that question. That's Let okay. Me the two gentlemen. Let's go to the 20th century. If you were going to name 10 important people, the two of you, the three of you, in the 20th century, how many women would be on that list? John, start with you. Help. Help! No, I'm just going to name the women. The, yeah, there would be way more men, but I would say um, off the top of my head, Amelia Earhart, uh, Mary Pickford for the movie industry entertainment, um, Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, Rosa Parks. I have Rosa on my list, yeah. Uh, um, what's her name? Martin Luther King's wife, correct? Because of Coretta? No. Okay, what? Ferguson, it's your turn. What? It's Ferguson's turn. Ferguson? No. Oh. Notable women of the 20th century. Wow. I got no idea. I was born in 1942. Uh, women uh, you just. Didn't have you. You. <laughs> He's Canadian. Yeah. Too. Well, how about. Yeah. The poor women in Canada, religion and, and, and saving people's lives. Mother Teresa would probably be an individual, yeah. but you know, women were just uh, not the minority, but they were just in the background. But the Why Mother Teresa spoke up all the time. But you see, they really weren't in the background, their brand was in the background. Their Correct. publicity was in the background. Correct. And whose fault was that? When you, when you say whose fault was that, hmm? well, I was going to say that there, there are plenty of opportunities to do our due diligence, but you're right. In the education system, we weren't taught. Maybe it was surface level. I can talk about Jane Addams, Princess Diana, Helen Keller, uh, Wangari Mathai, Rosa Parks, Gloria Steinem, Mother Teresa, and those aren't even the artists that influenced us or the athletes. How about mm -hmm. Bonnie Blair? How about Babe Dixerson? How about Steffi Graf? How about Billie Jean King? Yep. I mean, there's, there's a bevy. There's so many. We can talk about Amelia Earhart, Sally Ride, Bessie Coleman. There are so many. But I think the problem is, is that the teachers and the educators were teaching textbook history and did not want us to progress, which is why I couldn't teach about the Buffalo Soldiers and speak about our African-American heroes as well. So yeah. my question to you, Sally, is do you think now in the 21st century, have we made progress, in your opinion, in that tremendous area? Tremendous progress. Okay. And on all fronts, tremendous. It ain't there yet. Not at 85 cents to the dollar. Sure. And not at the salaries that sportswomen are paid compared to men. I mean, I, take the uh, woman basketball player. What right. was she earn this year? Compared to a male basketball player. It's not even close. No. It's not even close. Well, there's a reason. It's called business. If they were selling as many tickets and the TV ratings were as high, then it, 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 it would be the same. In tennis, women get the same because Billie Jean King fought for that. But the reality is, especially when Venus and Serena are playing, the, the women's tennis, professional tennis, was more popular than the men's. Did you know that? No, I didn't, but yeah. I'll tell you something. That's a higher rating. The networks had the women's basketball, the women's baseball, the women's field hockey, the women's lacrosse on. It would be as popular. Do you think it's because we're still... I mean, the, the media, how many women's teams... Does NBC or ABC or any or CBS? But do we need to be conditioned 
to like something we didn't uh, think we would. Maybe we weren't privy to thinking we can sit down and watch a WNBA game, but upon taking it in, we can tell ourselves this is really entertaining. So maybe subconsciously we are still putting genders and ethnicities in boxes that they don't yeah. belong in, right? Yeah. Maybe. So yeah. I, I guess at least, at least the education system, maybe it starts there and maybe with parenting, at least the education system now is such more, it's much more open than when I was teaching. For crying out loud, I once in 2008 took McCain's policies and put them under Obama's name. And I did the same thing for Obama. I put McCain's policies under his name. I walked in, that was the do now assignment. I asked the kids, which policies speak to you and why? They would all choose who they chose based on popularity, of course, but that didn't shock me. It's when my fellow colleagues and teachers walked in the room and that same social experiment was done to them. They had no idea either. No one votes for policy anymore. It's, it's not, and it's not political, but I think that's the same thing with women is that if we don't change our mindset purposely, it won't change. It won't alter. We'll just assume, I don't like this. I don't like watching that. Maybe we have to force ourselves to get ourselves outside of our comfort zone. And who better to know than John Lovett, Sally, Jesse Raphael, and Fergus Jenkins, because uh, you guys and, and, and Miss Raphael have done that. You've always stepped outside your comfort zone, whether it was working for different studios or different theater troops or Fergus in different teams. Uh, that's why I loved having you guys on this same panel tonight because you've been through so much adversity. And based on our comments, you're really resonating with everyone here. My, yeah, my question is you have to be realistic. I mean, it's just a fact that men are physically faster and stronger than women, and that's why they each have their own league. And the men are the, the men's sports, I mean, not that women aren't great athletes, there's a, a ton of them, but but as far as professional athletes, the men are are just they're physically, you know, it's just biology, they're bigger and stronger. So but, but John not, they run they don't run against compete against each other because it wouldn't be fair. But John, there are sports where women would be better than men. Okay. But we don't That's see fine. those sports. Well, name one. I, uh, equestrian. Gymnastics. Fencing. I named two. Gymnastics. Gym, gymnastics. Gymnastics, fencing, and equestrian. Three. Vol volleyball. Perhaps maybe. so. Maybe maybe it's not just I I, I see because no, when we think no. sports we think strength we think physical strength when we think sport but there's so many sports, sports that doesn't have to be strength right can require physical uh, strength or grace or grace I mean but uh, but I see where John is coming from as well because uh, again the masses decide and when it comes to the box office there is a disparity I don't think it's right but I mean there is well, I about pros versus pros I played in 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 um you know, charity tennis events and, and with uh, like, say I've hit with women that are playing on the tour now and above. And are they way better than me? I go, yes, but I'm not a professional tennis player, but I'm saying professional versus professional. If they were really bad, that's why they have separate leagues. You know what I'm saying? And I, and I'm not saying they're not great. I'm just saying that part of it is it's business. It's just about viewership and or selling tickets. Like, like in the women's tennis, you know, you have men's tennis and women's tennis and, and, and you know, a, a, a high school, a good, a top high school player would beat the number one woman in the world in tennis. It's just a fact. That's why they're separate. But the women's tennis is more pot, at least when Venus and Serena in that era, women's tennis was more popular than the men's. And that's a big reason why they started getting paid the same Besides Billie Jean King doing that. Well, but if you talk about it, And that's popularity, but as far as they don't compete against each other because they can't. But if you talk about something like lacrosse or field hockey, uh, that isn't a strength. Those aren't strength games. Those are uh, a lot of skill. Uh, where uh, endurance and a bill site and things like that that women are better at. But you see, we don't see those. We see tennis and basketball and football. Uh, pushing the, the major sports, yeah. Uh, guys and gals and pals, uh, let, let's once again thank these luminaries for educating us on topics that allow us to go deep. Because if you don't shatter the cycles of the past, you got to accept the problems of the present. That's how it goes. Um, I do want to ask Mr. Jenkins, the same question I asked John, 
who was gracious enough to give us his answer, and Sally with her question as well. We thank them. Uh, Mr. Jenkins, there are many different times in life where we find ourselves at a crossroads. Could you please share a moment in your life when you were at a crossroads and might have felt stuck, my friend? Well, the crossroads probably is started when I was 15 years old. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, I wanted to be an NHL hockey player. I had the opportunity to meet Willie O'Ree uh, at a young age. So he was playing with the, the Boston uh, Bruins in London, Ontario. My dad took me to the arena, and he wanted to basically show me that there's a player of color, Afro-American, playing NHL hockey. And if you think that you're good enough, like this gentleman, that might have an opportunity to, to be an NHL hockey player. But that didn't work. Uh, later on that year, Gene DeJura showed up in my hometown. He was a history teacher. He came uh, to, to collegiate high school, and he had watched me work out and play in the summer league. And he decided that pitching might be my best uh, uh, avenue and the opportunity to maybe become a professional athlete. And this is something that uh, as a kid, every kid wants to be a professional athlete, hockey, basketball, uh, whatever sport, boxing. And baseball didn't enter the picture until this gentleman showed up. And he was basically my mentor similar to my father. I worked with him almost two and a half, three years in the summer, strengthening my arm and understanding that pitching, if I was going to get a chance to sign professionally, I had to show that I had the great ability to do it. I got scouted by several teams, Detroit, Pittsburgh, Red Sox, Detroit, and also the Phillies is the, uh, team I ended up signing with at the age of 18, right out of high school. Went off to class D ball in the Florida State League. Uh, pitched for like six weeks, did fairly well. The next year they uh, they went to A ball in Miami. Had an opportunity to invite it to major league camp, made a 40 man roster. And things just kind of snowballed for me. Getting uh, the opportunity to talk and understand the, the art of pitching from Jim Bunning, Robin Roberts, Cal McClish, went to winter ball, learned how to throw a slider, which was the pitch that I thought that got me to the big leagues. Got to the big leagues in 1965 and uh, never went back to the minor leagues. And I had that opportunity to, to have one of the best managers in baseball Leo the Lipter Osher wow. as a manager. I had him for seven years. He gave me that opportunity to be a starting pitcher, to go out there and display my talent, and to win ball games, which I had that opportunity in a Chicago Cub uniform. I pitched in that organization for 10 years, won uh, 284 ball games in the big leagues, combined National League and American League. So when I look back, the crossroads of understanding that hockey was a great sport, so was basketball, but my best sport was baseball. And uh, I learned uh, the art of pitching, muscle memory, control. I just think that uh, if it wasn't for a lot of different individuals pushing and having, uh, I think, the understanding that this young kid at 15, 16 years old might potentially grow into a major league ball player, which I did at the age of 21, got to the big leagues. So when I look back, I had the opportunity to different gentlemen to show me the correct way to learn the game, especially pitching and to win and to be successful. So that's my crossroads. Wow. I, I can't ever imagine what you experienced because I mean, think about AAA little rock. The shocking part is when you went there, you would see parades of kids getting egged in a cafe. I mean, in Little Rock, you get off a plane and there's posters. And they didn't want players of color there. Right. Frank Lucchesi, the your manager at the time, told us, hey, just don't let things bother you. And you got along pretty well. But, I mean, you're talking about things that are against the very root cause of what makes us human. And you were the kind of guy that just didn't let things bother you. But uh, the things that you saw and experienced, I never will. 
I've learned about it. It's not enough to have experienced it. And yet here you are with a smile on your face and, and being jovial right. and teaching everybody. And that takes a, a mighty, mighty, huge man and human being to do what you do. And I really respect that from the bottom of my heart. That's why I do shows like this, because I want everyone to know the humanity. You're a legendary human being, first and foremost, my friend. Thanks, Avi. You, know, you know, segregation was still real popular in the South. And uh, I was one of four players of color. Dick Allen from Pennsylvania. Yeah. Marcelino Lopez from Cuba. Richie Quito from Panama. And Ferguson Jenkins from Canada. And Dick was the only regular player because he played regular. He had to play every day, players. right? He had to play every day because he suffered yes. through some abuse from time to time until he turned it around and people started loving him because of the fact that he was such a good ball player. He was. He was one of the best players in that ball club. He ended up uh, having that honor to go to the big leagues at the end of the season, rookie of the year in the next year. So Dick was uh, a talent that you, you couldn't find. But it, it, he got a chance to display it in the big leagues in a Philadelphia uniform. Wow. Did Thanks. they ever, Ferguson, did they ever uh, boo you or? Uh, oh, yeah. I, I, several, several name? different times. Uh, unfortunately, names cannot hurt you. And people would shout at you. Youngsters as young as I am. Uh because of the fact that they didn't want you there. And uh, I suffered some ridicule along with Marcelino, Richard and Dick Allen. And I just told myself I felt safe on the field. And when I left the ballpark, we lived in private homes. I picked up and taken basically, basically the family where I lived during that uh, summer months. And it, it was not a shock because you read about it. Now you're exposed in it. And you, you can't let that shock you to take away what you're trying to accomplish. Could and I think that's the number one thing same, I told myself, don't let those things hurt you. Could you stay at the same hotels? That they no, stay? we couldn't. You could no. not. In, in the 60s, no, we couldn't. I hate this story, but I have to bring it up. Because Where did he stay? We stayed in private homes. Uh, when I was in uh, class A ball, we stayed in a brothel. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and, but a lot of, and, a lot of times also in, in, in Ferguson, Tampa, Florida and St. Yeah. Pete, we stayed in a funeral home. <laughs> but a lot of times also on, on team buses, uh, you know, Bill Russell, before he passed away, had told a story. I hate to bring this up. You want to talk about injustice and inhumane acts of cruelty. Here he is winning championships with the Celtics. He gets more rings than fingers on his hands, <laughs> right? 11, 11 championship rings. And then on the eve of his first championship, he goes home only to find out that some of the fans broke into his bedroom and defecated on his bed. And, and these stories have to be told because we celebrate the celebrity, but we don't know what they went through to, to reach that level. And then also to be able to bite their tongues. I have to ask John and Sally this. Uh, John, I don't want to equate this because everyone has different experiences, but... I was going to say, Jackie Robinson, you know, came into baseball in 1947, yeah. and then Ferguson, you're talking about 18 years later... And you're still experiencing that. And right. maybe just, I know in America it was the 60s, but it's still shocking that after 18 years, people are still acting like that. Where I was born, when I 65, I was eight. Yeah. And all, me and all my friends, we didn't, I didn't know what a black baseball player is. I just know I had like baseball players, Hank Aaron, Mickey Mantle, Willie Mays. You know, it, I was until I was, you don't think of them as, oh, they're black. Or you just think they're Willie Mays. They're people, you know, and the kids. But it's, I, it's uh, I don't know, it's awful that that happened. It is. It is. And, and I think, you think, I, think it, I was going to say, I think what shocks me too, Mr. Lovitz, is that when we spoke, I mean, it could happen to entertainers too. Uh, you're all meant to to perform in the public's eyes. And, and if you're not on stage making someone laugh, John, then some people might go, well, where's the value in that human being? Or if Sally Jesse Raphael is not there educating us about several topics, then, and I like the fact that yeah. all of you did something after your careers, after the height of your careers, uh, you showed people who you really are. Like John got on stage and did stand up, but he did Broadway. Ferguson with his foundations, Sally as a writer and as a painter, I, those are the things that excite me because we never start, we never stop creating and we never stop showing people that. We're going to keep going. So this next chapter in your lives excites me, which is why I like talking about the present. But 
when I think of your pasts and what you have to overcome, I, I, Sally, you weren't going to bring this up because I know that you're uh, it's not something you want to really kind of touch upon. Not that you would be against it, but I mean, I can't imagine simply due to your sex, simply due to your gender, being fired over 18, 19 times in your career. Oh, more than that now. I mean, it, it's insane. Well, I'm with uh, John. There is nothing more useless than an agent. When John <laughs> was talking about his agent, right. I was saying, gee, maybe he has CAA too. Oh, so, so you met you met my you they met my agent then I guess right you must yeah, have met him. I was. My agent, my agent, <laughs> was it, John? Well, he 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 was at CA, but he went over to WMA. Okay, w William so Morris. William Morris. Over to Denver, but but yeah, this, yeah. I was at CA, which is the top top agency, and I was on Saturday Night Live, and in you know five years I had two. Oh, then you start getting offers, but I had two auditions, and then I'd been at other ones, and they didn't do anything, and I don't even. I'm booking my own stand-up now, and I'm, I have better deals, and I'm making more money than I did with my agent. Well, agents get jobs for people who have jobs. Yes, they do. Although there is a great line from Paul Newman. When Paul Newman finished a particular film, he was still on set. He called up his agent at that moment and said, I finished. I'm broke. Get me another job. So <laughs> I always thought that, that was kind of a funny story. But it, you're right. A lot of the times, if you're actually... Uh, uh, working maybe with a publicist, uh, in fact, and you're negotiating your own contracts. I had my literary agent negotiate a deal for me in which I had to write two screenplays as a ghostwriter, and I wasn't really happy with that deal, but I was locked in. And sometimes you're locked in and you feel like you're in a box because now you have to please your agent. And now you have to please the people that your agent has to please. So, of course, now it becomes this silly thing of trying to prove your value for people who don't even care about you to begin with. It's lunacy. It's complete lunacy. Absolutely. Well, I, I learned it for myself is that at a certain point, you know, you want to do things in your career and your agents or managers are saying, no, you can't do that. You can't do that. And then I finally went, you know what? I'm not relying on these people to define who I am or what I want to do. I'm just doing it. So I said, you go, oh, you'll be a stand up at 46. Well, that's too old. Well, I right. get it. Now I'm working on it. I go, I want to do it. I'm now trying to be a, a, a singer, right? You know, you're going to sing. I mean, I've sung a little bit, but. I go, well, what have I got? To, what, who cares? I'll, I'll see where I go with it. I like doing it. And I, I'm actually working with this guy, Randy Waldman, and I put together a whole nother show. And Randy's Barbara Streisand's personal piano player and worked with Frank Sinatra and Ray Charles. And he's been bugging me. He goes, that he keeps going, come on, let's do this show. He wants to do it. I go, you, you work, look who you've worked with. You want to do it with me? But my inspiration was grandma, the painter, uh, grandma Moses, we learned about it. it was started painting when she was 75 and that whole and became very world famous and you, it's, it's never too late to try something new and i don't feel any different than i did when i got no. live so and, you and you've always had faith i mean even back to the days where when you were eight years old when you were eight years old john when you were uh, eight years old back then and rabbi morton said i was the former leader of uh, temple beth hillel in north hollywood he asked you what is god what is faith and you asked him that question. Oh, yeah, by little... Bauman. It was Lou Baum, my friend Lou Bauman's father. Lou, Lou Baum. So, yeah, Morton, yeah. right? Morton. He asked you. And he, well, was... We were eight years old in Temple. Yeah. To... Some kid goes, what is God? And he said, well, you know that voice in your head that tells you right from wrong? He goes, that. Listen that. to it. Listen to it. Yeah. Right. But I'm thinking of hiring Ferguson Jenkins to uh, become my uh, pitching coach and just go to baseball. I, I, I would need I would need. Uh, Ferguson can I ask Ferguson a, ch a question? Please. About so I realize now from playing so much, even though tennis is one-on-one, -on -one, it's not just hit. The, the, I had a great tennis teacher, Alex Almeida, who was in the Hall of Fame and became my father and won Wimbledon and beat Rod Laver at Australian Open. But, he, you know, he teach me how to, you know, hit whatever, you know, serve this. But then he goes, now there's that ball, then there's the game. So, like, you know, you were talking about there's muscle memory, there's doing this, repeating it, learning to throw a slider. But I would like to ask you – then there's the game, which is, you know, the strategy, which is a whole nother thing that you have to know, right? Or you can't play. You're just throwing it. You go, what did, why did you throw that? Why did you? Can you talk, uh, educate me in a, about that part of it? Because there's a reason you won 20, 20 games for six years. You were outsmarting the, the hitters. But how do you, I don't know. Well, I just it, it, takes, uh, it takes basically knowledge, memory because of the fact that you're watching hitters play 
consistently, uh, we play 162 ball games. And at the time, there was only four starters on our ball club, Bill Hands, Rich Nye, Kenny Holzman, and myself. And I'd watch their performances and learn from different uh, pitches what they could hit, what they couldn't hit. Sure. But hitters that that are really, really excellent hitters, they're going to get their hits. Hank Aaron, Willie Mays, Reggie Jackson, uh, in the American League, Harmon Killebrew, uh, Al Kaline, so many. Mickey Mantle, who I faced a few times in spring training in an all-star competition. But the nice thing about it is that your strength against their strength, you try to win out. But you try not to make mistakes. Winning <laughs> on a consistent basis is minimizing your mistakes. And I, I had so many complete ball games in the major leagues where you pitch nine, 10, maybe 12 innings, which I've done a couple of times, going out there and understanding that what I do with the performance of you and the catcher is going to be successful because of the fact that you're working to one goal and that's to win the ball game. Yeah. So it takes a lot of muscle memory, uh, takes a lot of willpower, uh, takes a lot of know-how, and by far, the guys that play behind you, the defense, are the, the individual that save a lot of games for you. And then you got to have offense, uh, guys that score runs for you. When I look back at all the games that I won, you never do it alone. It's a it's a team sport. Uh, nine guys are on the field at one time, but you might have 15 or 16 guys to win a ball game. Uh, pitch hitters, pitch runners. Sure. So the aspect of pitching uh, on my part is you knowing the hitters when they step into that batter's box to start the ball game, that leadoff hitter right to the ninth. And in the National League, the pitcher had to hit. So you had to know if the pitcher was a good hitter or not. And but, even even uh, Mr. Jenkins, even veterans that can help, which uh, is lacking today in sports, not enough veterans on the bench who have a different sort of respect from their peers than maybe assistant coaches do. I mean, think of Bunning, right? Bunning was a 32-year-old veteran when you made your debut. And in spring training, he'd always talk to the younger players. And that was a plus for you because he would say certain things, but, you know, you've got to learn from your own experience. He'd say you've got to learn to get ahead of these hitters. He'd tell you right. that this guy's tougher on right-handed pitchers than other guys, or he's uh, good at breaking the ball hitters, uh, good fast ball hitters. So it was kind of like a word, a word knowledge that a lot of the veterans would bestow upon you. And when you think about it, all of that was a big plus for you because you took it all in. You absorbed everything and used it for some of your success. You had to have an open ear to yep. what they're trying to, to get across you. The conversation that you try to absorb is all about pitching. Totally. Yep. Absolutely. Totally good. About certain pitches you can throw to certain hitters. Basketball, Absolutely. curveball, slider, or a changeup. And what you're trying to learn is they convey – what they've done to be successful. Yes, sir. Ed Robach, Jack Balshan, like I said, Jim Bunning, Chris Short. Yeah. Uh, so many of those guys. Cal McClish, who took me to winter ball two different years, 63 and 64, that taught me the grip on the slider. And Robin Roberts, when he became a pitching coach with the Cubs, he would pound that information into you because he wanted you to be successful. So I tried to have an open ear. Yes, sir. All that knowledge because they've done it years and years before I had that opportunity to go out and display my talent. I love that. And guys, uh, uh, speaking of, of switching, I don't like to uh, switch topics, but we're going to do that now as we segue into topic number two, uh, which is another fun one, an educational one as well. Uh, a little station identification again. Uh, thanks to the studio who didn't believe in this last year. Now they do. So, ha. Uh, thank you for watching and supporting us. Uh, let's see where this thing goes. Uh, topic number two, guys and gals and pals who are watching and commenting, and we appreciate you because you're actually bringing us into your living room, and that does mean a lot. In a day and age where a microphone and, and headphones are, are meant to cause division between us, here we are getting to know each other, and that's pretty cool. Topic number two, guys and gals and pals, is something that I call history saves the day. History geek in me, so I have to get in there. Uh, we're social creatures. But what would happen sometimes during stressful times when we would need to pick up the phone and ask someone for a solution or advice? What if we had an opportunity to tackle several issues by calling upon 
several historical figures for help. Who would be the best historical contact to dial if we were in a car jam? Who would be the best to call if we experienced a breakup? What about being terminated from work? What about salvaging a day when you need a good pick-me-up? So with that, I'm going to start with Mr. Lovitz, guys and gals and pals who are watching. We've all been there, John. We've all needed some someone to lean on in life. If you could call upon a historical figure to help you get some tough situations rectified, which historical figure would you call and why? If either you just broke up with someone or someone broke up with you, you might feel awful about it. Maybe you'd call and vent to a historical figure. What if your boss just fired you? You're pretty pissed off. You could call, you could vent to a historical figure about this. Who would it be and why? And then the third one is you're preparing a speech at a wedding. Maybe you're nervous, maybe you're not. Either way, you want to have someone fine-tune it from history. Who would it be and why? The floor is yours, my friend, whenever you are ready. Uh, well, well, my if I got, you know, broke up with a girl and I was upset, I would call uh, President John F. Kennedy because, um, first of all, he, he was a ladies' man, so he really knew women. <laughs> ladies' men don't know women. According to you. And... <laughs> Ladies men, they're ladies men because they don't know women. Oh. Mm. Interesting. Anyway, that's who I would call. And I, but no, um, I, I heard a, a recording when they, of him when they had the Cuban Missile Crisis and he's in the White House and he's talking to the generals and, and, and his cabinet. And, um, you know, it was... They were building, um, you know, the Russians were building launching pads in Cuba. And so they were like, you know, if they if they put rockets there, they could, they're 90 miles from Florida and they could attack the United States. What do we do? So all the generals saying, we got to declare war. And the cabinet members go, no, we can't do that. And that's all they were saying. And then you hear John Kennedy goes, well, there's several sides to this. He goes, first of all, we can't, if we do... We, we don't want to start World War III. He goes, then, but, but then we can't do nothing. And he goes, then there's a third side. And he goes, then there's a fourth side, a fifth, a sixth. And he looked at the whole picture. And I was so impressed by that. I thought, thank God that guy was president then, you know. And he, they figured out what to do and they avoided, basically, avoided World War III. And um, you're so, so I, I have to say this because you're right. With respect, Sally, I would, that's who I would call. Well, I want to say this to you because you, you brought him up, right? You brought him up, which is great. But I want the, the younger generation to know, October of 62, we were the closest. If we listen to Robert McNamara, who in the fog of war in his documentary finally opened up about some of the mistakes he made, we're all human. Uh, Camelot was not in agreement with one another, with the exception of Robert Kennedy and John Kennedy. We were on the brink of World War III. Khrushchev was just as animate about making sure that we wouldn't enter uh, that that path. But we were so close to it. The Cuban Missile Crisis was the closest that we probably went uh, to battle. And, and really, again, John F. Kennedy was the one who stood tall. And the reason for that is because he didn't trust his military. Because a year before that, the Bay of Pigs fiasco happened. And he was told that, oh, we're training. We're training all of the uh, the Cuban refugees who were taxi drivers and attorneys and, 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 and just uh, doctors. They weren't prepared for battle. They were told they were going to be trained. They weren't trained. He trusted his military. He didn't listen to Eisenhower. Eisenhower told him, watch out. God knows he didn't listen to him. And, of course, after that fiasco, Kennedy said, I'm not trusting my military, which probably is what led to his assassination. At that time, of course, LBJ got the memo and did listen to his military when we saw how involved he was with the Vietnam War. But I'm glad you brought that up because we were so cl close to the brink of elimination. So close. So I, I thank you for bringing that yeah. up, really. Can I answer now? Yes, yes. Sorry. I, I, well, go ahead. But I have two more, two, he okay. has two more questions. Yeah. I had to consult someone. First of all, I am I really am not a person who's ever been indecisive. I'm pretty decisive. But I would uh, ask Sir Arthur Conan Doyle for advice. Oh. Wow. <laughs> Uh, uh, is there a particular reason? Well, why wouldn't you ask Sir Arthur Conan Doyle? No, no, I, I would, but in your case. Well, he he just, he knows everything. 
He knew physics. He knew chemistry. Yes. He knew uh, how to do anything. I mean, either him or Moriarty, but uh, I think <coughs> Sir Arthur. I like that. Can you imagine the pressure, though, on him? Like, if everyone's calling for advice and he can't get it right all the time, then all of a sudden it's a letdown. Like, can you imagine, like, you're waiting for a while, you're calling him up, you're going through your Rolodex, and he's not giving you good advice. Then then what? It's like a letdown. Well, I don't have a second. Yeah. He's my first. I don't know. Maybe it's Moriarty. Maybe Agatha Christie. <laughs> Moriarty, yeah. Agatha Christie, wow. That, Sally, that's that's incredible. I mean, picking up again the dial and asking Sir Conan Doyle. God, guys, if you don't know much about this person's history, please do your due diligence. That would be a great phone call. Uh, John, you have a couple of others too, my friend. Okay. Uh, whenever you're ready. Well, what was the second one again? Sure. So the scenario for the second one would be uh, your boss fired you. You're pissed off. Who would you call and vent to if you could? Well, he's not alive, but I would call my father, you know. Oh. And uh, he was good at, at uh, you know, making me understand why it happened and what I should do. And Sure. He he would probably say, no, you're upset, but that's life. And, and you, you got to find another job. And that, you know, it, it happens, you know. And just ask yourself, what did you do? And, and learn from it and keep going. John, working at the hospital was probably the most inhumane experience you had. You weren't fond of working at the hospital when you were younger, right? No. Well, my daddy built the, the hospital in Tarzana, so I got a job there when I was 19. He got me a job there when I was 19, but after college, I went back Yeah. because I finished college, and then my dad said, you're on your own. So I said, well, look, I, I don't have any money, so I said, I'll make, he'd always say, I'll make you a deal. He'd, he'd, I was always working, so he goes, I said, I'll, he'd always say, I'll make you a deal. Like, save, you want something – work and and i'll match you and you can get it you know by half of it sure so I said to him i'll make you a deal i'll get a full-time job and save enough money and then when i have enough i'll move out and get my own place because i go i just graduated i don't have a dime so he said okay so i i went back to the hospital on my own and got the job and so i was an orderly and um <clears throat> on the fourth floor the surgery floor and this is the most ridiculous thing so an orderly basically they have compared to everybody else that works there, they, they're the least trained. I mean, you, you know, you, you, they teach you how to, you, you bring the patient, you're there with them for eight hours and you bring them water and change their bed. Here's how you make a hospital corner. And, and you, and if they come back from surgery, you, you take their blood pressure and their respiration and their temperature, which is, you know, nothing. And um, it's ridiculous because the orderly, the least trained person in the hospital is with the patient more than anyone, unless someone's visiting them and just there all day. The doctor comes in for five minutes a day. The, the nurse just comes in to give them their medicine. So these, the patients start, the person they see all the time is you taking care of them. And so, you know, whatever they need. And, and it's kind of sad. Women would go there in their 60s and then after about three days, they'd start getting disoriented and alien, and and they started thinking I was the doctor, and and there was there you had the nurses station in the middle, and I had a, a room on either side of the nurses station, and these women started screaming for me, <laughs> and the nurses go, they're driving us nuts, like Doctor John, Doctor John, you know. So I would get close to these people, and I would try to cheer them up. But after about six months, um, some of them started, they died. And so I just, it, I would, I couldn't handle it. I, I had to quit. I you just, would need someone to cheer you up at that point because you got close to it. Yeah, it was awful, you know, and, and right. I'd always say, oh, this is a great hospital. And my dad built it. And sure. You're going to get better. And I, you know, be positive. And I would, you know, I want to be a comedian. I'd try to make them laugh. And um, <clears throat> there was a woman there with, um, I think she had uh, MS and she, her voice is really shaky and she couldn't move. So I'd say, all right, we're going to, I'd have to get her out of bed to change her sheets. I go, all right, we're going to get up on, you know, instead of one, two, three, I'd go eight. So I go one, two, eight, you know, and then the next day I'd get there and they go, John, the woman in four oh, room 406 said to tell you eight, you know, which, you know, I knew what she meant, but she was, it was sad. She was like, oh, my husband doesn't left me and he, cause I got this and, 
there was one guy, an English guy, goes, oh, John. I go, what did you do? He goes, I was an actor, you know? And I go, oh, Shakespeare? Oh, yes, John. And I wanted to, you know, do all that. I was like 22. And <laughs> and then like the next day, he's like screaming for me. He goes, John, I can't breathe, John. I'm the orderly, but that's who they ask for because that's, you're with them, you know, when they're awake for eight hours. And it's just, it. I mean, to me, it's because it's screwy. Not that they're asking for me, but the least trained person in the hospital is the one that's with the patients more than anybody. And so anyway, and I remember that guy really liked him and then he like was dying and it was just awful. And yeah. I just like, I couldn't take it anymore. Yeah, no, I, with my dad who's very sick that they, they walk in and every specialist has a different diagnosis and it happened once three minutes apart. And it felt like a Marx <laughs> brothers routine. They're walking in and each guy's got a clipboard with, with his eyeglasses and a different diagnosis. And we said, you guys are conflicting with one another, but they didn't care. They each had their own idea of what they thought should be done to help my father, medically speaking. So, guys and gals, uh, medically speaking aside, I do have to tell you this right now. Uh, topic number two is about to end because Mr. Ferguson Jenkins, who has been uh, bestowing upon us his knowledge as well, will be asked the same question that John was asked. Uh, Ferguson, we've all been there. If you could call upon a historical figure to help you out, maybe uh, during a breakup or someone you broke up with, who would you call and why? Second scenario is your boss firing you. You might be pissed off. Who do you call and why? And of course, the third one is you're preparing for a speech at a wedding. Which historical figure would you call and why as well? The floor is yours whenever you are ready. Good, sir. Oh. Historical figure. Hmm. Well, maybe go back to uh, an English individual, probably William Shakespeare. Uh, that would probably uh, give you some knowledge on the novels that he had a chance to to write. And the biggest thing is there was a lot of death situations in his novels. So very smart individual uh, that uh, that wrote uh, things that people I don't think understood back then, but now they, and now the 20th century, they understand. Sure, that would be a great. What, what about? What if you're in a situation where you you were fired? Who would you call? Which historical figure would you call if you were fired? Well, being fired, uh, <laughs> I've been traded a few times. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think the biggest thing is that you you have to consider yourself lucky that you're going to a ball club that wants you. So it's inner strength a lot of times. Sure. You know, my my first trade, I I was traded. I was 21 years old from the Phillies to the Cubs. knew nobody on the Cubs team except Glenn Beckert, second baseman, who we played against in the minor leagues. My second trade, I get traded to the Texas Rangers. I didn't even know where the the Texas Rangers worked out, what kind of stadium they had. <laughs> but uh, I soon found out. I had a great manager there, and Billy Martin. Uh, he it was another manager took me under his wing. Who, who himself got fired about 30 times. Oh, yeah. By, uh, the, by the Yankees management. He, he didn't like people. <laughs> and I like people. I like people. <laughs> but Billy Martin was uh, an individual that, that told me that all the press that I've heard, that you can't right. win anymore. Uh, the, the last year I played with the Cubs, I only won 14 games. And there was a lot of articles. I had a bad arm. I couldn't win. And I told Billy, I said, if you give me that ball every fourth day, I'll win some ball games for you. That that season in 74, I started 42 games. Wow. I won 25. <sighs> and I was a Cy Young runner up oh, to wow. Catfish Hunter. Wow. So when I look back at someone understanding that you got fired. And that's what basically when you get traded, you're fired. That I had an opportunity to, to basically turn it around and have a pa a positive thought that when I took the mound, I was out there to win, not to lose. And unfortunately, I, I won 25 ball games to help that ball club. The Texas Rangers went from last to second. It would have been nice if we went to first, but we had to play against Oakland. Oakland was a Real strong ball club back right. 
Wow, that's that's absolutely incredible. And again, your history, uh, much like Sally's, much like John's, always intrigues me. Just to know about your dad's history and what he went through as a, as a ball player as well. Uh, of course, y- your family migrated to Canada. Born in Barbados, we could track your family Bible uh, to, to Barbados as well. Your family was called the Arcadians. So, you know, I, I think that there's so much rich history when it comes to your father's legacy as well. And to know what he went through in his struggles. My question for you real quick is, were his struggles as beneficial to your awareness of struggles that you went through? Did it help you knowing that he went through some of those struggles? Were you looking out for them? You know, I I think because of the fact that my dad and I, I was an only child, my dad and I talked quite a bit. And his family basically, as you said, migrated from the Barbados to Nova Scotia. And uh, his father was Ferguson Joe Jenkins, became a porter local uh, on the trains. And they migrated from from, from the eastern part of uh, Canada to Windsor, Ontario, yeah. where my dad was born in 1909. And he didn't uh, become an athlete until he moved to Chatham. He was a fairly good ball player, but he got the chance to play with a lot of different players in that Chatham area. They were called the Chatham Colored All-Stars, and they, they won a couple of championships in, in 37 and 38. And uh, I think the talent that my dad had is genetics. Right. It rubbed off on me. I wasn't he, an he outfielder. Could, he could always catch. He could always catch the ball. He was good as a catcher. Oh yeah, yeah. But, but he, he used to hit me ground balls and fly balls. But I decided that pitching might be the, the strong avenue for right. me. And uh, because my dad was left-handed, he sure. threw and hit left-handed, and I'm all right-handed. Right. But what was nice is he took me under his wing to tell me at the age of 10, 11, 12 years old, if you want to be a ball player, you got to try to do a few things that, that I had to go through playing and uh, understanding what the game was all about. But he suffered a little bit in the thirties, a boycotting uh, diamonds, things like that, not playing in certain cities. And even in Canada, you had a bit of a, a boycott that yeah. they didn't want you to play in certain cities. But when I look back at what my dad handed off to me was the knowledge of the game and the love of the game. Without that, you're nothing. And you know what? And there was something else you guys did together, which I think is pretty cool. You guys both, not at the same time, but you played at the same ballpark at Sterling Park. Yes, we uh, did. It was a park that was named after Mayor Sterling, Archie Sterling. And you played right. baseball there yourself. And your dad used to reminisce about playing center field there in Chatham. That's pretty cool. Yeah, well, I do. a lot of similar things happened uh, in, in life. Yes. And that, that ballpark was pretty significant. Uh, when I moved from, from Colburn Street to Adelaide Street, that ballpark was only five blocks away. Sure. So I had the opportunity to go to that park and and then have my dad hit me ground balls and fly balls. That's but beautiful. He never would – tell me how good a player he was. I had to basically get the information from different gentlemen that, that were still alive at the time. My dad was a decent player, never got that opportunity to play anything but intercounty and, and, and barnstorm baseball through uh, Canada, played some in Michigan, uh, some in Detroit. What is, um, what is barnstorm baseball? Barnstorming is... You take uh, several athletes, could be 10 to 15 athletes, and you play in another city against another team, and you're barnstorming. Satchel Page was famous for that. Bob Feller. There were so many other athletes that that uh, made money in the offseason by barnstorming. Yeah. Even you mean they, weren't, they, were they weren't an official team. They just got together and said, let's go to a city and pick right. up a game. And, the pickup and game. Like played, the pickup uh, game. Put yeah. similar uniforms on. And because of the fact that you might be a, a, an individual that's popular, people want to see you play. So in that city, you show up, ballpark, you might play maybe one or two games. First game, very small crowd. The second game, you might have maybe five or 600 fans. You know, back then, people didn't show up for, for baseball as well as they, as they do now. But barnstorming was something that you could display your talent. 
so and many. It, cer- of those it certainly wasn't for this either. Too. It wasn't. It wasn't for the money. Uh, my that. dad said he made twenty five dollars a game. There you go. <laughs> Which is not a whole, not a lot of money. No, and I brought this up to uh, Saxon Page ever. And did he give you advice? Sorry, I just went, sorry. Yeah, yeah, please. My dad, uh, yeah, he would tell me that when you put that uniform on, this you're Satchel playing Page. As, as a team. Well, Satchel Page, I only had an opportunity to see him in in, in footage, but I never had a chance to meet the gentleman. Oh, oh, I wonder. If you... Yeah, but can you can you imagine? Sally got paid at one point in the fifties two dollars a show. Two dollars a show. I'm Sally. glad to have it. I'm glad to have it. Wow, that is absolutely they incredible. They pay me twelve dollars a salary a week. Wow, wow, twelve dollars a week. Unbelievable. Twelve dollars a week, and I didn't have CAA as an agent. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, you must. You are quite the negotiator. Yeah. yeah well, <laughs> well, you know right. what. Well, that's the thing about performing. You obviously you, you were dying to be on the radio. Yeah. Hey, I had to pay to act till I was twenty eight. You have to pay to do it. I mean, that's like twelve bucks a week is nothing. So you obviously, what made you you loved it, right? You just were dying to. Well, what I did was I learned to play the horses. In other words, El Pum. <laughs> They had a track called El Comandante. So I would take, I knew the guys that ran the track. And I knew which horse was going to win. Now, they wouldn't let me bet big. Well, I didn't have the money to bet big. But they'd let me put the $2 on a 100 to 1 shot or whatever. And I never told my husband, that husband, I never told him what we were living off of. We were living off horse money. <laughs> That's pretty really good. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And yeah, and Sal, you, you were the morning person five days a week. It was good training, though, right? Yeah. I mean, even though it was unusual because there's no, there were no, no women in radio at the time, none. But at least no, being in not. Puerto Rico allowed you to be on the air. So that's. We were six days a week. Six days a week. Unbelievable. Guys. And when I came to New York to work on, I guess it was WNEW FM, they had an all woman radio idea. Only there was the only, I was the only woman who'd ever been on radio. Right. And like most suits, they chose women because they had great boobs or they were pretty, uh, whatever. You know, that's sure. always been the case. Well, you know, it, I got to respect you for, for a lot of things, but even when it comes to some of the they funny things. big boobs on radio? What? Well, they, no. did, they did. The people there wanted them on radio. The people no. working there. The guys who, who hired right. them. Right, right. The guys who hired them. But you yeah. know, we know what else. But I'll tell you this much, though. Speaking of speaking of uh, interesting, unusual situations, when you worked for WIOD, <laughs> you called at McDonald's and you guys ordered thirty thousand hamburgers. That's which right. Was, later on, Woody Allen used that story in one of his movies. He did. <laughs> he did. And uh, we used to um, call other stations and yeah. allow the all night guy to do the work. And so I could go to the bathroom or uh, whatever. Sure. But the major problem, uh, you asked me if things are getting better. Yes, they are. But ageism is now the problem. When John said 46 was too old to do stand-up, is that what you start. said? Huh? Yeah, start from there to start at that age to start oh, learning how to do it not yeah i mean here we are we're always saying i love this by the way that uh the two men running for president are too old well i'm 89 after they finish their four years they won't be as old as i am now i'm talking to you i'm traveling I'm going everywhere. I have a lot of jobs. I'm working as an actor. Yeah. I've, been, I've done 53 movies. 
I've done four Broadway shows and 80 and 80, whatever, 82 is Biden now. What is it? 81. 81 oh, no. he's too old. And at 89, what would they think of me? Well, I think they'll think that they're in trouble because <laughs> <laughs> you could teach them well, a thing or two about age, a thing or two. And there's no doubt about that, Sally. Ageism is it's only a number right it's oh, only a it, number it's it's I, I always thought that if you can count your age you're fine if you're able to count it you're good you're in good shape most people can and like i said ageism is not something that should be held against people based on their talent their experience uh there are people i would i talk to people who are older because that's how i learn i'm not going to achieve wisdom unless i learn from people that already have it and i'm going to speak to people that have been there before and have also paved the way and maybe that's also a sign of a disrespect because ageism and disrespect are kind of married to each other, I think. It's very disrespectful. What if someone disrespected our parents or our grandparents who are just as old? So I agree with you there. It's I don't see a woman my age on television. I watch TV. I don't see anyone my age. Right. Right. That's, I mean, it's... unless you watch a rerun of the Golden Girls and they were 20 years younger than I. That's right. You're right. Hey, well, you know, it took me took me 15 months to get the suits and ties to watch this show. So what do they know? They don't know anything. Guys, I know you're watching. I do love you. Uh, guys, we're about to enter uh, our third topic right now, our final topic. It's going to be a lot of fun, uh, thought-provoking questions, different questions for everybody, and then a quick tribute video for John, Sally, and Ferguson. Hope they like it. And guys and gals, we like you. We appreciate you again for hanging out with us. It does mean a lot on a Saturday night, no less. John, the question I have to ask you is – it's about risk. What's the most significant risk no. you've taken in your life? Well, tr trying to be an actor because there's just the odds of making it are, are pretty much zero. And um, it just the fact that I said, I'm going to be a comedian and nobody was saying, you know, clamoring for my services, you know, it's just, it was just, personal decision that I made when I was 25. I'm going to focus on comedy. And um, I had teachers saying I should do that, but you know, and that's what I remember. I said, I'm going to go to the groundlings theater, which is an improv theater group and try to get in the company, get in, get on stage and get seen and get work. And a friend of mine, uh, Mike Sabatino, he from college, he got an agent. I said, how'd you do that? Do that? He said, I got in a play. They got to see you. So I drove, from the valley in LA Woodland Hills and I have about five minutes, I get on the freeway and I was really committed to doing it. And no one was telling me to do this, but me and all my friends are they're going to you know, medical school or law school and this, and I'm going to be a comedian. And I was like, I was so scared. I really was like crying, like sobbing. I was scared to death. Like what am I doing with my life? But I really wanted to do it. And then when I got to the class and got on stage and I did some improv and the, Randy Bennett was my teacher from Texas. He goes, well, that was good, but you could have been funny this way. You could have been funny this way. And it was the first time I'd ever heard that, you know, as a class clown and people said, stop goofing off. And then this guy's going, well, that's a good way. Here's some other ways you can goof off that are be, you know, effective and make people laugh. And I was just, I go, oh, I'm home. I was in heaven, you know, but just risking that. I mean, there's, and then everyone's saying, what are you doing? Give it up. You know, what are you doing? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And, Oh, my friend goes, you should go to law school. You know, it's only three years. And, and I'm like, but I, I, I couldn't go to law school. I don't have the brain for that anyway. <laughs> There's no way. And everyone, and you're getting older and older. And, you know, I was 28 when I got SNL, which is not that old. But, you know, in two years, I'm going to be 30. And, and as I always said, I was 28. I go, it felt old because that obviously that's the oldest I've ever been. So, I, you know, there, there was... I was just going for it and I just committed to it and, and it was scary, but, but uh, once I committed to it, it wasn't as scary. I wasn't scared because I, I just was determined, really determined. And that's part of why I made it. And I'm sure you, Ferguson and Sally that it had to be the same way. The competition is so crazy. I mean, there's, there's, I mean, there's less jobs as a professional athlete than I know growing up in the sixties, there was, there was only, um, there was 20 teams, not 32. And so that's way less players. And then every, every 
I remember growing up, including Fergus in the 60s, every team seemed to have – now they had four or five guys that ended up in the Hall of Fame. I mean, they were like – like not kind of good. They were all like super – like the superstars – of the game, so that, that's even more competitive. So he, I mean, well, Fergus and, and, you, and Sally can tell you what it takes to make it. I mean, it's, it's. I think I think everybody that's been a part of this show, everybody, we have guys and gals. We're not bragging about the Hall of Famers and luminaries just because of their accolades. It's not just about the name or the fame or the acclaim. It's what they stand for. They use their platform just like Sally, John, and Ferguson do. And, and John, I know what it's like as well. Being in that station wagon. Uh, not having enough money for a protein drink like like this that I make before the show. Uh, <laughs> taking the old orange juice and tuna fish, Ferguson, you know what that is, and just shaking it up, uh, learning how to write and do uh, any kind of anything that was on the beat, whether it was sports articles, anything I get my hands on just to make some money before I got that door. And, you know, it's it's it, it you prove to yourself how passionate you are about what you love, because sometimes love is not eternal. Sometimes love is fleeting. Sometimes love is temporary. But when you do what you love with abundance, and it's not even necessarily about the paycheck, as Sally brought up and as you brought up, God Almighty, good things are going to happen. And what I love about what you brought up right now is you didn't let your regrets become your life story. You did not let your regrets become your life story. And there's so many people that do. And I'm sure they look back. Some people were close to me as well. And they say, I should have done this or I could have done that. And that's the saddest thing in the world to me. When you hear that, that's really sad. I'll tell you what the scariest thing for yeah. me was, getting married. Was it? Yeah. Who you marry determines so much about your life. That's so true. Now, do you think that's because of compromise? Is that because you have to? No, it's just if you marry the wrong person, that affects everything. The job, the life, the money, the everything. So the scariest thing is who you marry. Getting wow. married. And you don't have a crystal ball either, so you don't know how it's going to end up. That's true. That's very true. Wow. Uh, man, I, you know, again, sometimes you're passionate about people and you're passionate about uh, your, your livelihood. And those two worlds, if they don't mesh, it's going to be a powder keg. I guess, uh, I guess you're right about that. Uh, this is topic number three, guys and gals and pals who are watching here live. Episode number 182, the consecutive 182nd consecutive episode on Saturday nights right here. On average, three luminaries, three different luminaries every Saturday night for 15 months. We do it here live, guys and gals and pals. I have a different question for Sally uh, that I want to ask here as well because I think it's a very important question to ask. Um, I do want to kick it to Ferguson first, though. Ferguson, if you don't mind, my question for you is what does success look like to you? Well, you know, it, it, it takes a lot of hard work. Uh, it takes, uh, I think, uh, stability. Uh, you're popular, but you hope that the popularity part of it transfer into success sometimes. But success comes from hard work. Uh, having good teammates, having a strong will uh, to be successful. Uh, you go out there, and I'm not sure if you if, if you think you punish your body, but it's it's a consistency that you have to continue to have over a long haul. Not one year, not two years. I did it for 19 years, to try to be successful. And when I look back, there were there were some downfalls. But I think I had more successful years and seasons than I had uh, bad ones. But it, it does take a lot of hard work, uh, good management, uh, good front office, especially in, the, in the, uh, the sport of baseball. Because a lot of times, if you go to a city that is undesirable, it's not a baseball city, you know what? no matter how hard you play, and how successful you are, you don't get the accolades. And you know who can make or break you? Our reporters. They, a lot of times, a bad clipping, a bad report, a bad uh, game that, uh, unfortunately, it happens in the game of baseball. You play so many games, 162 ball games. And as I said, one year, I had 42 starts. And I wasn't 
the dominant pitcher every start, even though I won 25 games. But there's that there's that one reporter that might say, well, you know, Jenkins, you're too old, which I've had it happen to me a few times. Well, and there you are. Unfortunately, <laughs> you gotta you gotta play the mind game sometimes, right? Because of the fact that you're getting older, you don't throw as hard, you don't uh, pitch as well, and the number one thing that you gotta tell yourself that you're gonna not be defeated. And I've been very fortunate enough to to have some success on that end of it, and. The success brings accolades, and I think it's it's a personal thing when you have that. I agree with you, and I think that your determination is your truth. I want to take you back to a really quickly a day in 91. Jack Lang phones you up Saturday afternoon. He says, you get the required amount of votes. He's going to phone you on Sunday at about 5 p.m. and let you know. You're going to have a press conference on Monday in New York. So in your house, you're fixing dinner for the kids, and it's 5 o'clock. No phone call. Now it's seven minutes after, then 10 minutes after, and boom, the phone rings. You pick it up. Jack Lang calls you up and says, and I want to get your reaction to this, Ferguson. He says, congratulations, Ferguson. You're in the Hall of Fame. Incredible. You know, I had, had had the opportunity to talk to other players, Warren Spahn, uh, Harmon Killebrew. What does it feel like when you get that phone call and Jack Lang tells you you're now a Hall of Famer? You're in a fraternity of so many great, great athletes. Believe me, I was humble. Uh, as soon as Jack hung up, he said he's going to get back with me in a half hour. I phoned my father and I told my dad that I am now in the Hall of Fame, Dad. Uh, he, at the end of the other end of the line, I could tell he was crying. Wow. Uh, wow. Unfortunately, it, it was kind of bittersweet. Because uh, my wife had been in a car accident, and she was in the hospital, Marianne. And unfortunately, uh, she, she just didn't make it. She, she got pneumonia. But I took a clipping from that paper the next day to the hospital and told her I have to go to New York. Uh, I got inducted in the Hall of Fame with Gaylord Perry and Rod Carew. They're going to have a press conference on Monday, which they did. And I had an opportunity to tell the Hall of Fame I wanted to, to be represented as a Chicago Cub. Flew home the next day, and unfortunately, Marianne didn't make it because of pneumonia. The doctors just couldn't save her. Uh, she was in a really bad car accident. Mm -hmm. But, you know, life is, uh, throws a lot of scenarios at you. Uh, and I think it, it basically just kicks you in the gut. A lot of times... You can, you can hang in there and take it. But there's sometimes you can't take it. And uh, I went to therapy for almost a year, uh, knowing that uh, complications, even success on one end, could be bittersweet on the other end. And I had to learn to cope with uh, the fact of losing a wife, which was uh, pretty... Uh, Pretty devastating. Well, I, my deepest uh, condolences. I, I brought this up probably only two times in the show's run, but uh, I was two weeks away from getting married. And my fiance was uh, at the florist, about to turn the knob, and she collapsed. And a couple of weeks ago, she told me that she was getting debilitating migraines, which I get too. And like a moron, because I want to be honest, that's what this platform should be about. I said, no, just take some Advil liquid gels. Well, she did. She did. She didn't listen to her own voice. She listened to me, and uh, she dropped dead. She had an aneurysm, uh, and ever since then, I've been trying to wrestle with that, Ferguson. So it's you're right. Two weeks ago. Yeah. Wow. You, know, you wrestle with it, and you wrestle with it, and then, as mm. as you just said, as you stated, you never know what. No one gives you a blueprint for life, That's but right. you have to be the artist. You have to grab that paintbrush and keep painting. There has to be a ton of guilt, right? Every day. Every day. How do you get rid of that guilt? I write. That's why I became a writer, I think. Uh, I was writing before then, but I, it wasn't really all the way in the door. Now I'm just committed to writing and work. And the, the, the sweat is the sweet. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I love the pretty 
after the ugly. You know, people talk about the ugly, and then you realize, you know what? You can make people proud, especially if they're not here anymore, by reminding others of their name and what they like. So I always like to ask the question, uh, yeah, she may not be here on planet Earth, but what was her favorite ice cream flavor? What was her favorite movie? And then we get to learn about the person, and they're still alive at that moment. It's a beautiful thing. Right. And I, I go to Oklahoma uh, every year and put a wreath on the gravesite. She loved pink and white. I put a wreath on wow. the gravesite. But, I mean, it's just, it's uh, it's trial and error a lot of times. Uh, and your brain can cope with it, but your heart can't. You don't have a choice, really. Nope. Today right. is the birthday of my daughter who died at 32. Oh, my. Today. And I thought about saying to you, Avi, no, I don't think I want to do this. But uh, you find it, you go on, you have no choice. I have, um, when Ali died, I was doing the television show. Sure. And Phil Donahue said to me, uh, Sally, you've gone through the worst thing a parent can go through, losing a child. So take a month off. Don't work. Just take time off. And I said, thank you. You always give good advice. And then Joan Rivers I happened to talk to her about a day later. And she said, whatever you do, don't take any time off. Continue to work as hard as you can because by working, Avi, you will keep yourself busy and get used to the grief. The grief will build up. Two people, two different stories. And, and your daughter? I took Joan's advice, by the way. Right. When it, when it comes to your daughter, who you just mentioned, what were some of the things she liked to do? Activities or hobbies or interests? Oh, she was a great, great professional chef. She was a grand manger. They're the people that look at the plate after before it goes out into the restaurant. Sure. And um, because and she was the grand manger of the plaza of the Sheraton Hotel in Washington in Hawaii, um, she, uh, when you're in the kitchen, uh, if, if that's your life, that is your life. There's not much more that, uh, that happens. But uh, uh, holidays are terribly important. You cook for Easter, you cook for Christmas, you cook for Thanksgiving. Sure. Um, her name, Sally? Hmm? Your daughter's name? Oh, Allison. Allison. Uh, we got to know a bit about Allison, and that's that's. Oh, yeah. She was a very, John, she was very funny. Really, <laughs> naturally funny. I love it. I um, wish I had, you know, picked, gotten some of that. I didn't get the humor. Oh, no, you, 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 you do. No, you, no. Yes, you do. <laughs> no, the, the moment, the moment, the moments. You know, just, who in John's family was funny? Who was funny, John? Um. Uh, well, my dad was very funny. He would goof off a lot, and then, the, and then my mother was. She was funny without trying to be funny. She didn't. She wasn't aware of it. <laughs> she would say funny things all the time, and I go, "Do you hear?" Like my sister was at. Finally, she caught herself when she goes, oh, I said something funny. I didn't mean to. I go, what? So I have a sister. And she, goes, she was editing a hip-hop magazine. And someone asked my mom, what's uh, Lisa doing? And my mom said, she's editing a hippity-hop magazine. <laughs> Rabbits? I go, what are you? But she would just, the way she, I talk a lot like she does. I mean, that's how I learned to talk. <laughs> you know, she go, why do you talk like that? I go, my mother, you know. Uh, sometimes we don't even know what we pick up. I had a my dad was uh, divorced and got married again. Well, she, would she get would she get upset when sometimes you guys would laugh and she wouldn't know why? Hey, you know, she's no, like, no, no. Kind of funny. I like making her laugh. That's part of it. I, I I could really make her laugh. You know, she was a great audience. But my dad got married again. My other mom when I was nine, and her father became my grandfather, and he was really funny and just. 
I, you know, I didn't know the guy, and I was like, "Why is he so nice to me?" But he we, he became like another father, and we were very close. And he was very he was a very successful businessman, but he was also very youthful and 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 very silly sense of humor, and sing dirty songs, and you know, pull my finger, and I mean, he was he was he was hilarious. And so that in a league of their own, I imitated him in that a lot. You know, I want to mention this to Lisa. Lisa, no one's interviewing here. We're having a conversation. That's what this show's about, having organic living room style conversations. That's the beauty of it. And you know, the other person that influenced me, my friend David. Uh, one second, John. One second, John. I have to interrupt you and I will. Okay. Uh, so thank you for your comments. Thank you for your comments, Lisa. I'm sorry, John. Thank you for your comments. But uh, no, if you want to watch a show with interviews, there are a bevy of them, a plethora, a smorgasbord, if you will, on YouTube. This isn't one of them. But thank you again for your comment. John, please. Well, another person that influenced me a lot was my best friend, David Kudrow, who's, you know, Lisa Kudrow and friends, her older brother. Sure. So I, I grew up with their family in, oh. in Tarzana, and his father was a doctor. And I, I met David in, like, fifth grade, and we became best friends in sixth. And David's really funny. And he really influenced my humor and Lisa's a lot. So those, those are the people that, you know, this. And then when I was 13, David and I, David and I saw Woody Allen's first movie, Take the Money and Run. And we just flipped and go, this guy has our sense of humor. I mean, I just thought he was just the funniest ever. Yeah, and, uh, I think I think a lot of times it's uh, from I hear from comics, uh, the, the approval of their parents or getting a laugh from them, especially when they've succeeded. It's something that they're still after. You know, they want to be able to kind of get that, that joy. I think it was George Carlin who said he can never make his, his – he's always trying to get his mother's approval. And there's so many of those stories that you hear, so many. Um, no, my mother, I could really make her laugh and, and – um, I like making her laugh. And that's the one thing people go, why are you, people go, I want to be a comedian. I go, well, I go, they go, why? I go, because I like making people laugh. I mean, it's just the best feeling in the world. You At know? that moment, it means that they're actually happy and they don't even know why they were sad or mad two minutes ago. It's the, it's great. It's a great thing to do. Uh, mm. Especially if you ever watched my previous wardrobe last show, I had this blazer on button down, <laughs> no chest hair. And I had like about maybe two gold chains. John, it was like, the worst decision I ever made, but the best decision at the same time. I loved it. I made a bold oh. choice. And John's not selling it. John's not giving me anything right now. Why well, was it? I'm <laughs> glad you dressed the way you are now. I appreciate that. But you know what? Because you said that, I wish I hadn't. But thank you. Uh, I wouldn't I, have seen that. No. Well, I wish you would have. I wish you would have. Uh, underneath. I, I want to ask another. John, how yeah. do you know uh, when you do stand up, how do you know when to get off the stage? That's a good question. Well, sometimes you go too long. The truth is, it's just about like I headline. So if you do about 50 minutes, 55 minutes and you're, and you're doing great. And if you get off, you'll, you'll get a standing ovation. If you, if you keep going to like an hour, 10 or 15, it's, it's too long and you won't. So you, because the audience, you really need them to listen and follow you. And they're really, they're really using their mind a lot. Like you're really working their mind. And after about 55 minutes, they they like it, but they start getting tired. So, it, you know, it's an old show business adage. You leave them wanting more. So you, yeah. you get off. And that's kind of how you know. Well, but well, do, you're have, paid have, to do a whole show. You know, you can't just quit after, you know. Have people ever gotten up and left and you saw them leaving when you're doing stand-up? Oh. Wow. Oh, yeah, you know. Because uh, your job, you know, th these days, I mean, my job is, sa is satires to make fun of everybody and make fun of myself and make fun of everything. And then, you know, sometimes you say a lot something. Of it's reading the room a lot of times. No, no, they're leaving because they're going, you think they're offended and they're just going to the bathroom, you know. And then, <laughs> you don't know. They might, be, they might be angry because they were holding it in. And all these funny two people so long, right? Don't mad and they left. What? I said they might be angry. They look, they appear to be angry as they're headed to the restroom. Because they've been holding it in because you've been making them laugh for so long, but they need to pee. Yeah, it could be that. Yeah. No, you can't. But you I also mean, have to read the room. Stage, you can't. See, you know, you see the first couple of rows, and then it's just dark. So there could be people in the back leaving. You don't know. You know. Uh, I want to say this, guys, especially leaving. No one has left this virtual arena or room. We thank you for that, guys. Our topics are done. Uh, what I'd like to do now is play a tribute video really quickly because. Again, respect these luminaries. We've been here for a long time already. It's been a great, great night. Uh, I do want to ask John 
and and Sally and Ferguson to hang around for two more minutes. I have a tribute video for all three of these luminaries. Oh, can I just say one, one thing? Yes, with, yes with, please. I wanted to say earlier, when Ferguson said the reporters can really make you or break you, and, um, you know, I have to say, I met two baseball players that, that had, because I don't know them, but the press ripped them, ripped them, ripped them. I met them, and one, one was Barry Bonds. He was oh. so nice. He was so, I said, who is this? guy the reporters write about and he couldn't have been nicer and i said you know i i saw you and you were like you know number 24 and i love you know the giants bobby bonds your dad and willie mays when you're 24 you're listening bonds i go must be his son it was i was so excited he goes i'll bring you to giant stadium i mean he couldn't have been nicer and the other guy that had you know a horrible reputation who ferguson mentioned he was on saturday night live he was i he was so opposite of what his reputation was, was Billy Martin. He was like so nice and almost like shy and very soft-spoken. Of course, I was in friends with him. Like you, you really knew him, you know, he was your ma manager, but he couldn't have been nicer too. And I've seen stuff in the press. They just, they're horrible. You know, well, then, it's, then it snowballs. it all just, just snowballs. Yeah. You know, you're doing what they right. wish they could do. And they like sports, not all of them, but some of them are. And they, yeah. Hope that, so they'll just write something and feel they have low self-esteem and then they feel good and, and, and they just make stuff up, you know. Well, you know what? You've made you guys have made me feel good and the audience as well, based on these comments. John Ferguson, Sally, anything you'd like to tell one another before I pay you tribute one at a time? Anything you'd like to say to each other? Floor is yours. It's been fabulous uh, hearing your stories. I know that uh, we all have different walks of life. And I think that uh, in a stand-up comic, I don't think I could do that. And I uh, Sally. You know, being a broadcaster, I tried it. <laughs> Radio was good for me, not TV. <laughs> well, well, I couldn't uh, pitch. I can't throw. I throw like a girl. You uh, pitched. You pitched as good as anyone ever did on television, because what? you make everyone around you better. So how about that for a pitch? I couldn't throw, and I couldn't do stand up, and I couldn't. <laughs> Well, I don't think I could do this. This would uh, <laughs> I'm so tired. Oh. Well, no, you guys are able to give me that second wind. I appreciate that. Uh, guys and gals and pals, I want to play a tribute video uh, for Sally and John first. And then Ferguson, I'm going to put you backstage for a moment. Uh, John, I'm going to put you backstage for a brief, brief moment as well. Uh, this is for Sally because, Sally, you've inspired a lot of people. It's about a minute video that I put together because I think uh, our audience will love this. But really, it's to honor you because you've done a lot for many, many people. So guys and gals and pals, Sally, Jesse, Raphael. Wow. Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico. In that chair, she was great, huh? Oh, love it. Ah. Oh, great. <laughs> Just Phil. Phil. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, Dudley Moore. Yeah. There's Cher again. Oh, you've inspired so many people, so. Ah! <laughs> 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 Jimmy Carter, yep. Betty White, yep. Taj Mahal, one for one. Wow, there's Larry. Larry. Oh, we lost Suzanne Summers recently. Oh wow, 
Incredible, Doctor Ruth. Ruth. Barry Manilow. Barry Manilow did a movie called Beast Game that was. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I appreciate Thank you for who you are. Thank you as well. Thank you, dear. Do you uh do you have a nice time, Sally? I did. It, a, a wonderful time. Thank you. I appreciate you. You have a great rest of the weekend, my friend. Same to you. Hard as it will be for you, but I understand. Thank you, my friend. Sally Jesse Raphael, guys and gals, a legend of a human being. I want to bring in another legend, Mr. John Lovitz, right now. Uh, bring him in because I have a video for John as well. Uh, it's been a magical night. It's been a great night filled with great conversations. And uh, John, got to tell you, my friend, you know, you're, you're very modest. but uh, I have the lights on in my house. It's starting to get dark. Does it get dark in LA? I heard it does sometimes. Yeah, look, I for, I, yeah, I didn't have to turn <laughs> the sun just went down. Jeez, I, I miss going out there. Uh, the guys, this is Mr. John Lovitz because hopefully you enjoyed this video and hopefully John enjoys this video. A bit about his uh, career and some of his, his work early on and later on as well. Steppenwolf, Steppenwolf. John, you dig this jam, right? One of my favorite songs. Yeah. Wow. Kind of you. Yeah, I don't know where you find some of those photos, man. Well, 100. percent I also know that that's that's a song that you're you're, you're a fan of. You were this. Right? Jesus <laughs> Christ! It's like John, you, you were a fan of that Steppenwolf. Do another song. face. Right when you were a kid, you were a fan of that song. I was thin till I got Saturday Night Live, and then I started eating. I could eat out again, and I I gained 10 pounds every year for. Oh, you, lived, you lived in New York. Lived in New York a lot. All of this from 1985. It's still there. John, you look the same, my friend, but uh, so tell me, that was a song you enjoyed since you were a kid, right? Yeah, you know, it's funny about that. It's the, the band Steppenwolf, Magic Carpet, right? I, when I was eight, my parents said, take, you, you have to learn an instrument. So I said, I want to play the drums. They're like, no. It's like, all right, <laughs> piano. 
So anyway, my piano teacher's brother was the, he was from Israel and his brother was the um, manager for Steppenwolf. I believe it, it was crazy. But anyway, wow. yeah, Mr. Carper, I think I, um, what's the lead singer, John? Um, I know, yeah, I know what you're talking about. I forget the name, but yeah. Yeah, you, yeah, uh, you, you do. yeah, that's one of my favorite songs. A lot of here, the John has an age, he hasn't changed. I agree there. Uh, man, I want to say this too, because I know you're not going to like taking your roses, but yeah, you did inspire me in many different ways because as a storyteller, you never abandoned the craft. You always kept your work honest and truthful. Uh, you made us laugh, but you're still doing it, but you're also doing it in a way that I think is inspiring because you're trying something new, and that's pretty cool to try something new in life. And also, thank you, we won't get into it now, but that discussion we had about... Uh, some turmoil happening in the world on the phone earlier uh, this week, that hour conversation meant a lot to me as well. I can't wait for us to explore that at some point too. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate it very much. And the thanks for, I mean, I'm, you know, I said, I met Ferguson years ago and, and anyway, yeah. so nice and interesting. And Sally, Jesse Raphael, yeah. what an interesting, inspiring career. I never met her, but it was nice to be on there with her and, and learned a lot about her as well. And Had a fun time. I did. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, very different. Yeah, I liked it very much. Well, my friend, you have a great rest of the weekend. I will be in touch soon. Fun, and I learned a lot. That's what it's all about, edutainment. From, from Her Ferguson and Sally, I learned a lot. You know, I love that. I love it. Mr. Lovitz, have a great rest of the weekend. I will talk to you soon. Thank you, Avi. The legendary John Lovitz, guys and gals. The legendary John Lovitz, and from one legend to another. And I would literally, I said this before the show, so I'll say it live. It would take me hours and weeks and months and years of this very show making an attempt to chronicle the entire career of Ferguson Jenkins. It would take years to chronicle this man's career. Oh my God, but it's worth it because his story is not just a movie. His story is a series. So for those listening, the suits and ties, the guys that I work with, this is a series. His story is a series. And we're going to talk about that after the weekend. But Mr. Ferguson Jenkins, my friend, did you have a nice time? Oh, definitely. Yeah, that was enjoyable. Yes. Uh, you know, learning uh, someone in and out of the, the, I think, the world of Hollywood yeah. is incredible. And especially you're having to go to work. And, and as John said, couldn't get a job for, 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 for years. And he had an agent. Agent wasn't doing a real good job for him. So... I mean, we all have different walks of life, and it's it's all about pressure. Well, you know, Ferguson, you you've done a lot. With it. You've done a lot of these. So, would you say this is unique? You had to uh, think this is oh, a different sort of thing? yes, definitely, really unique. Unique. Well, my friend, you know what? Uh, I want to play this tribute video for you as well because, and can you please show us the logo? We want to see that logo. I know we want to see that. There Cubs. we go. The <laughs> Cubs. Chicago Cubs. I love it. I love it. I love that you wore that. Guys and gals, for Ferguson Jenkins, uh, this is our love to him. He's given us a lot as well and has educated us. Hope you enjoyed this video. Good, sir. Beautiful. Thank you. Absolutely. Hockey. Harlem Globetrotters. That's beautiful right there. It's a beautiful thing. Wow. Incredible, guys. And there's more. Mental attitude and concentration are the keys to pitching for Ferguson Vink. Class personified, guys. Class personified.
you know, I say this to some of my guests. I'm going to say to you, man, your presence is a present because I like being around you. I really do. You have an infectious smile and you have a great attitude and a, a, a great amount of knowledge. And I feel like I could sit under that learning tree forever. Thanks, Avi. Pleasure. Uh, I do want to talk about some other stuff, guys. I, Ferguson, I want to invite you back. We have just so many luminaries coming in. One of the greatest boxers of all time next Saturday. We'll figure out a date that works for you because what I want to do is I also want to talk about uh, glory, guys and gals. This is incredible video here. Glory and grief. Uh, this is a video, and there's another one called Black Excellence, the Chatham Colored All-Stars. Uh, would you want me to show a clip of this? I'd love to. I'd love to show a clip of this. Uh, this was sent to me, actually, by someone you know. Guys, this is a clip here, if you want to take a look at this. People know my story. A kid whose odds achieving baseball immortality were a long shot at best. A kid from Chatham, Ontario, that would go on to be the first Canadian in the Baseball Hall of Fame. But this story isn't about me. This is a story about a group of men from Chatham who are not talked about nearly enough. A team that broke barriers, the Chatham Colored All-Stars. Well, the Chatham Colored All-Stars were started uh, in Chatham by Archie Sterling, who was the mayor of Chatham for quite a few years. And they were a team that uh, stayed together for about a good five, six years, winning OBA championships across Ontario. Well, there, there wasn't that many. You know, and, and as, a, as a former educator, I got to tell you, I found this piece, I watched it earlier, I found it to be really educational, and I think everybody should see it. Ferguson. So uh, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that video when you... Uh, you know, you... Uh, it took about six months to put it together. Six months. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to let people know that life is not a a bed of roses, as they call no. it, wine no. and roses. I mean, there's bitter and, there, and, and there's a sweet part of it. Uh, and the nice thing about it is I tried to let people know that things that happen in life, it happens to everybody. We're all we're all in the same boat, even though it's not put down on on film or in a in a book in the press. But we all have a, a I think a I'd say a story to tell and try to conquer that that story. And what's well, nice about it is Major League Baseball did a great job. Well, you know, we're going to be, as we talked about earlier, we're going to be doing a lot of work together behind the scenes, and I'm looking forward to it, my friend. Thank uh, I you. want to, yeah. Well, you know, your your existence transcends the passage of time. You really are a class act. God, Thank glad you. I got to know you a bit, and we'll talk. Uh, we'll talk soon. Thank you for showing up here tonight, Ferguson Jenkins, guys Thanks, and guys. Abby. Appreciate it. The legendary Ferguson Jenkins. You take care and have a great rest of the weekend, sir. Thank you. What a night. What a night. Um, you want to simply talk about uh, name, names. I mean, well, let's start with names, right? My name is Avi Klein. We got to know John Lovitz. We got to know Ferguson Jenkins, and we got to know Sally, Jesse, Raphael. Age is a number. 89 years young. She was very, very passionate and asking questions and wanted to get to know everybody. And then Ferguson Jenkins, also traveling the country, also making sure his story is being told. John Lovitz, who, believe it or not, is shy, overcame that shyness and became one of the most recognized and, dare I say, greatest comedians of all time. And we got to know them. And we're going to get to know them again. We're going to start the voting process, which is going to be very, very tough. So stick around for that. I do want to say this. To a certain viewer that was annoying me in the comment section, please go. I don't want your comments, okay? I, I don't want your BS stories and calling cast members and making it about you and just go away. This is a positive place. Okay? Appreciate that. Made my decision. Made my choice. Going to hit that block button. We're going to see Dion pretty soon. Uh, let's bring in, I want to talk about a really great night because we're not done, guys. We, If you want to you want to talk about the second half of the show, some people call the second half of the show the hidden gem of the green room. Well, it ain't so hidden. There's a lot going on here. 
Uh, we're going to be voting real quick, but let's bring in John Red. Papa Red's ready to go here. Guys, uh, Papa Red, he, the man, uh, Ferguson Jenkins. Oh, you're a baseball guy. Man, Ferguson Jenkins. What? <laughs> it's amazing, Avi. Cooperstown Hall of Famer, brother. Tell you amazing. what. Let's bring in Truly Julie and Giselle right now. Let's bring them both in. Giselle and Truly Julie, hello. Hi. Hey, guys. Oh, my gosh. And Howard Collado. Let's bring in Mindy yes. Red. The wow. gang. Guys, uh, let's start this. We're going to do this real quick because we got a big, big show to go. But, guys, yeah. who? Two out of three will move on. Who will advance to round two of this thing? Right now, we're going to find out in the comment section. We have a lot of you commenting, so get ready to vote. Now, you have yes. to vote on who won topic one. Here's what I require. Hold on. I require all of those in the comment section to type topic one and then the name of the person they're voting for. Topic one and the name. Do not skip topics till we get to topic two. Let's stick with topic number one. So starting with topic number one, Mindy Red, I don't need an explanation. Who gets your vote? And Giselle, if you could tally this, I would appreciate that. She tallies Absolutely. this all the time backstage as well. Guys, John. And Julie and Howard doing stuff backstage with, with Mindy and John and his videos. Mindy, who do you have? John. John Lovitz. One for John. From one John to another John, Papa Red, who do you got? Man, I'm going to go with – oh, man, it was a toss-up between John and – I'm going to go with uh, – I'm going to go with Ferguson. I'm going to go with Ferguson for round one. Who do you go with? Ferguson. Okay. Whew. Man. I'm going to kick it over to Truly Julie. Sure. Oh, so exciting. So much life. Uh, so much passion in topic one. Let's – I'm going with Sally on that one. Topic one. Sally gets a vote for topic number one. Guys, yeah, you're doing it right. Jeff, Jr., and Andrea – Topic number one and who you're voting for. Now, you could tell us why in the comment section. That's okay if you want to. Lester, mm -hmm. how are you? But again, topic number one and who you're voting for. Howard Collado. Yeah, again, tough one, but I'm going to go with John. Just resonated so much with me. So John Definitely resonated John. with you. Yep. Uh, Giselle is tallying, but we're going to get her vote right now as well. I am going with Sally Jesse Raphael. Sally gets Giselle's vote. All right, Ramon. John. Lewis. John. Allison. John. Hey, Lori, you're still around? Mr. Jenkins from Lori. Sharon, Mr. Jenkins. So two straight for Mr. Jenkins. Jeff Sr., John. Phil, John. Lewis. See, guys, a lot here. A lot here. There's a lot. There's so many coming up. Like Lewis votes for John. Dion, Mr. Jenkins. Hillian votes for Sally. Brian votes for John. Absolutely, Brian. Andrea votes for John for topic one. Justin votes for John. Cool. Uh, you voted for Ferguson, right? It's a Canadian thing. Uh, Christopher <laughs> votes for Sally. Ed votes for John. Chad votes for John. Let's see, guys. We're not done. This is only topic number one. Now I'm going to scroll up. Thank you, Colette, for your comments. Appreciate that as well. Green Room, it's what we do here live. You heard what Sally said. No, she could do a show like this. This is, uh, it's the, yeah. you know, sometimes you might call it the danger zone because we step in here live every Saturday night. Live. Dealing with different topics. Dealing with, with different luminaries. Tech. All of your comments as well. Yeah. Not to mention the fact that this show keeps on going even after. So, yeah, this is what we do here. Uh, we have more, more, more votes. That's why we want to get you, have you guys get the word out. I really appreciate that. Jeff voted for John, and Joe voted for John. Julie voted for Ferguson. If I didn't pull up your comments for topic one or your vote, let us know now. Leah votes for John. Uh, guys, all right, so let's see. This John has really done well on this first topic. Uh, just like that, we move on. Thank you, Craig, for topic number two. Now, if I did not read your vote for topic one, simply type it again, and I'll get to it right now. But we're going to move over to topic number two, starting with Howard Collado. For topic two, I am going to go with uh, I'm going to go with John again. Actually, I could always explain later, guys. And even if yep. you want more in depth, sure. I, I, I challenge the Green Rumors to have more in depth explanations by Wednesday's Black Box. We'll talk more about that later. Absolutely. All right. 
Definitely. And Andrea says, uh, well, yeah, I got your vote. So I got your vote, Andrea. But you said he really resembled your struggle and you felt him. Yeah, listen, hey, anyone that makes you feel, uh, that is a gift. Julie? Yeah, uh, topic two, I'm going with John. John? Mindy? Ferguson. Mr. Red? I'm going to go with Sassy. <laughs> Sassy. <laughs> Sassy. Yeah, my gosh. Sally, Jesse, Raphael. On the Sally, second. Jesse, Raphael. <laughs> Say that three times. <laughs> I want to stop for a second. Sally, Jesse, Raphael. Yes. In the Thanks, TKN uh, Celebrity Tournament. Amazing. Avi, think about that real for quick. A uh, what yeah. you just did tonight, Avi, John Lovitz, Ferguson, Sally, you had them on one panel together. You did that tonight, Avi Klein. It was a fun night, Mindy, but you know, we're all... telling you she couldn't do this. That's well, what well, TKN is. That's what TKN is. Amen to that. We're all a part of this thing and doing it. Dorothy votes for Ferguson for her second topic. Giselle, did I get your vote? For topic two, no. Uh, I uh, <laughs> This one is hard. Uh, I am going with Ferguson for this one. Ferguson gets it. Jeff votes for John. Dion votes for Mr. Jenkins. Brian votes for Ferguson as well. Justin concurs and votes for Mr. Jenkins. Rita votes for John. Lewis votes for Sally. And there are two straight coming up for John from Phil and Julie. I think it was kind of... Might have been strange for Sally to see a Phil Donahue in the comment section. <laughs> An imposter Phil Donahue. I didn't even think uh, about that. that for the, our, our Phil Donahue from the Bronx, no less. Uh, Chad votes for John, and so does Andrea. Votes for John. Allison votes for John. Christopher, thank you for watching. Appreciate you, my friend. Votes for John. Lewis votes for Mr. Jenkins. Killian votes for Sally. Colette and Joe are each going to vote for Ferguson. Kelly, let's get your vote, my friend. It is time to vote. You're right. Jeff Sr. Mm -hmm. votes for Ferguson. Craig, the energy in the room is very strong. Thank you so much, my friend. Let's get your vote as well. Appreciate you. Ramon votes for Sally. Sharon votes for Mr. Jenkins. Ed votes for John. Phil says I'm the real Phil Donahue. <laughs> you are, I'd, rather be, I'd rather be fake if you're real uh, Sally says, Sally's had the best conversations on this radio show that you listen to yeah that's awesome let us know uh, Johnny McKinney nice to see you where you been huh 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 Johnny I'm kidding we love you John voting for John Lovitz uh, L Lori yeah voting for Mr. Jenkins T2 I'd like too. to have seen Mr. Jenkins in uh, the Terminator 2 judgment that would be a good one why not I could see why that not? Ferguson, why not Ferguson there uh, all right, guys. I think I think that's all of your votes. Uh, again, again, before we get to the third topic, let us know who you're voting for, Ashlyn. But before we get to that, she is a great conversationalist. There's no doubt about that. What you saw was the epitome of great conversation tonight, guys. Yes, Absolutely. Was. Organic Absolutely. Organic ebbs and flows, and and being able to engage with everyone, and that's really what it's all about. And I, I was able to see Sally of yesteryear which I love yes. now, hosting her. Show, there were moments where I saw that. And I loved seeing it uh, yes. because she's been someone I've looked up to for a while and a lot, a lot going on behind the scenes. Brian says tonight has been something to behold. My go-to is Mr. Jenkins, their stories, their lives. Avi, thank you. No problem. Uh, guys. All right. Topic number three, this time let's start with Giselle. Topic number three, Giselle. Topic three. I am voting for Sally, Jesse, Raphael. Sally gets your vote. Howard. For topic three, yeah, I'm also actually going to go with uh, Sally as well. Yeah. Okay, Mindy. Ooh, uh, I'm going with Sally. I was really torn on this one. Really, really, really torn. I want to do. I want to pitch a sketch to a skit to John Lovitz. <laughs> The, the ooh thing that you're giving me right now. Like, it could be about the most mundane things, like whether it's have Frosted Flakes or Cheerios. It could be the whole thing we could do. Oh, my gosh. On the Friends episode, when he's the guest, he takes the Cheerios and he's... Yeah, we don't need to hear about that. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for that one. I was waiting how long that, that would take. Yeah, Mindy's uh, vote. John? Uh, man. None of these? No. 
I'll, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll save you all that. I'm gonna uh, right now. It's a clean Carson sweep. For... Remember when he played that character? What's that, John? I'm gonna go with Sally as well. Sally as well. Sally gets John's vote, and then uh, truly Julie. Yes, for topic three, I am going with Sally as well. Sally gets your vote. All right, turning it over to the engine that makes this thing go. As you know, we're going to count your votes right now. Can we go back to the 80s? I have tried. That's why I always reference the old DeLorean, Andrea. It never works. Uh, we have <laughs> T3. Not as good. Not as good. I like yes. it was so long in T2, but it was still okay. Uh, T3, Sally Jesse Raphael gets Lori's vote. Julie votes for Sally Jesse. Phil, that Phil, votes for John. Chad Ooh. voting for Ferguson. Keeping it in the country. I like it. Canadian. Canadian mm -hmm. power. Keep it in the all country. Right. Loyalty there. Ed votes for Mr. Ferguson, but I love them all. Yep. Lewis votes for John. Bring back the critic. It was a great com uh, cartoon. There's no doubt. Uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of laughter here. Ha, ha, ha. I like that. Uh, Ed Hauser. These were the best. Jeff Jr. votes for John Lovitz for the third topic. Justin voting for John. Joe voting for Ferguson. Okay. David votes for <laughs> Ronald Reagan. Yeah. Uh, Junior, he's still around. Can't vote for mm. Senior anymore for obvious reasons. Ramon votes for Sally. Allison votes for Ferguson. You're not voting for Ronald Reagan films, though, right? Those movies weren't exactly uh, <laughs> one of my Western? favorites. Left a lot to be desired. Lewis uh, <laughs> votes for Sally. Jeff Do Senior votes for Lovitz. Face. Rita votes for Lovitz. John Lovitz, guys and gals, on the show tonight. Well, Billy, I know. Holy smoke. That's crazy. Sally, I have a tremendous amount. I'm voting for her. Uh, she is done a lot for her life. Huge role model, absolutely. Mm -hmm. so Lewis good. votes for Ferguson. Leah votes for Sally. For sure. You got that. Brian, Sally squeaked by John for me on that one. She was a character overall. Uh, Andrea votes for Sally. Sharon votes for Sally. Jill votes for Mr. Jenkins. If I have missed your vote in the comment section, now would be the time. To let us know who you vote for and why. I'm going to scroll up real quick just to make sure, to double check. Uh, let's see where things stand right now. Wow, this is real close, too. Guys, well, Ferguson gets another vote from Jill. Okay, listen, hey, JW's in round two. If you don't watch the black box, you'll be confused, but we have a video for you, but you got to watch 8 p.m., Go to the page of Joe Rizart, R I Z A R T. Go to the, that's our own Joe Rosatano, who's in the second round, still a host of the show officially, although Julie might have something to say about that. More on that later. A lot of stuff going on in the black box. Kelly White, Giselle, what they're doing. How about the show that Papa Red made famous? This is the show that he puts on his back every week. Howard Collado, not so much. And maybe he is, but for, uh, for other reasons. Maybe he has the dubious honor of having negative. 900 or something. Yeah. You have to watch the show. Billy Jack votes for Fergie. Thank you so much. Black Box is amazing. Thank you. All right, we're picking up some Fergie, but we just got two straight Ferguson votes, which is pretty cool. Let me bring this up here. Okay, we're all doing this live, guys. So, uh, again, bear with us. We have more show to go. We might go three hours and 45 tonight. We'll see. Uh, Mr. Jenkins... That topic two, you put three, but in the previous one, I'm going to count that. That's okay. You vote for the best network out there, TKN. Thank you so much for that. Awesome, Chad. David Chad. Downs voting for the immortal Ferguson. Okay, another vote for Mr. Ferguson. All right. Things are getting a lot closer right Ooh. now. Ooh. 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 See it right here in the comments section. Hell yeah. A lot closer. Uh, we have man. another one from Otis for Ferguson Jenkins. Let me tally that up and pull it up. Black Box is amazing. You're right about that. Joe Rosart. Everyone's voting so positive this evening. You're right. We're always positive. It is real close. <laughs> I'm telling you right now. And we're reading this right now. I'll let you know now. Sally, Jesse, and Ferguson are deadlocked. Almost. Almost deadlocked. It is close between the two of them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We have another vote here from Christina for Mr. Jenkins, which makes it 35. Oof. Mm. This is mm. guys. Do you understand? Oh, All the freeze. luminaries want to be in this second round. Every single one of them want to be a part of this thing because it's not just about the fifteen grand for the one who wins it all, or the trip for two to Greece. It's about what this show represents. They want to be the one to say they won this entire tournament that has allowed them to learn and listen and grow. That's what it's all about. All three do deserve it, but hey, we're, I don't think that's going to happen tonight. I don't know. Close race. 
It's close. Luca, it's close. Luca votes for Mr. Jenkins. Luca, we haven't seen you. Saw you earlier, actually. So we have another one for Jenkins. This, this would be really bad if across the board. Oh my God, Allison, really is that close. a vote? Is that a vote for him? Is that a vote? Are we going to count that as a vote? I don't know. Are we? All three what were great it, tonight. Allison? I don't know if I can count that as a vote. I got to see Tell an actual Allison. official vote. I need a drum roll here. Like yep. a <laughs> Come on, we do. We definitely need one. Let's see if that happens. I don't know. All right, guys. Ten. Nine. Nine. Wow. Eight. Type in real fast. Seven. Seven. Robert Coda happens? votes for Mr. Jenkins. Robert Coda, nice to see you. <sighs> guys and gals and pals, right here in the private chat section, I'm going to read it. I didn't know what was going to happen. Allison, we did get your vote for Ferguson, so thank you. We appreciate that. Here's where we are. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we'll count this, even though uh, he's the top vote getter. Alexander and Ed voting for John. Okay, so two more for John. Guys, with a grand total of 44 votes, John Lovitz will move on. But remember, two out of three move on unless there's a tie, in which case three move on. Right. We're reading it here in the comment section, in the private chat section. Yes, we are. Mindy, how much does Ferguson Jenkins have? 37. Julie, how much does Sally Jesse Raphael have? <laughs> 37. All three have advanced, guys and gals. All three will be in round two of the T Camp Celebrity Tournament oh my again. Who will they face? We don't know. Stimulating conversation for sure. They're wow. all in round oh my gosh. two of this tournament. They've all advanced. It was close. I'll let you know now. Ferguson was down. Ferguson yeah. was down three points, but you guys keep kept voting for him. Uh, amazing yeah. stuff. We're going to get all of them in the round number two. That is awesome. I got to go get a swig of water. Um, man. man, you know. I got to tell you guys, there's a lot of videos to play. There's a lot going on. There is. Oh, man. I'm blown away. First of all, you guys know, monster baseball fan. So here I'm thinking, oh, my stars. I finally get my Cooperstown person. I'm stoked thinking nobody could top that. And then you have John Lovitz, who is one of my all-time favorites, who is in my all-time favorite movie. Then you have Sally. Also yeah. my all-time favorite. It's like I'm sitting here geek geeking out, barely a voice, because I'm I'm literally geeking out over seeing three of my favorite people, my childhood right here in front of me. And then we got to know them. Yeah. Had yeah. Deep, inspiring conversation about the human beings behind the people I love what they did. We got to yeah. know those yes. human beings. How awesome um, is that? I do want to say this. Huge. Julie, please send that link over to Dion. Uh, we'll make that really quick tonight, Dion, because we're at two sure. hours and three minutes again. Got to try to squeeze everything we can here. <laughs> uh, guys, again, this is a video. I want to play you all a video that will show you what's been taking place Ooh. in this incredible network called TKN. Remember, our talk shows, if this tournament's not enough, we'll be debuting some before round one ends, most after round one ends. That will be fun. Guys and gals, if you haven't seen the John Red Challenge, there's a lot going on there when it comes yeah. to this John Red Challenge. Uh, yeah. Check out this video. Four minutes. Here's what you've been missing on Wednesday nights. Papa Red, Papa Red, welcome. Oh. What is up, guys? John will be facing every single person here one at a time. It's a gauntlet. I'm going to showcase an image. Once you see that image before you, you'll have 10 seconds to bring up a word that you associate with that image. Hyped up at the end of April, we have got Ooh. yours truly, Avi Klein, up against Christopher Kid Reed. Whoa. Up against Christopher Play Martin. Whoa. The legendary lyricist himself, Brett from Naughty by Nature. Oh, nice. Whoa. You know chance ball jw welcome there yeah. <laughs> thank you for that Avi. what's going on everybody i would actually like to talk to young howard for for a brief second i don't want to face a howard who's in the negative negative. and i know <laughs> what i am capable of when i push myself and that is what i have to bring tonight and i thank you for letting me know howard get your shit ready so john how many points are we putting up for round number one against jw Let's start with five points first jw give us one word once this clip is off screen because i have somebody like you father contributor strongest guys did you hear strongest it's what they said yes it was said all right all right so so far jw is at negative five <laughs> 
Papa Ren, if you lose 30 points or more, none of the points that you have will be carried over to round number three. But if you're able to maintain 60 or more, you will take the amount of points that you win with you to round number three. That is Ooh. huge. Savory. Good. Oh, good. Do we do we count good, guys? All right, Truly Julie's got five points. Mm -hmm. Holy White. The image before you is D. Wallace. Actress. Smile. Hair. Famous. I think we said famous already. Still lost with the theater. One word, so. Stand out. Comedian. I'm going to ask for comedian, guys. Do we count comedian? Uh, but Lester, no. Mm -hmm. John Red is down another five. Mindy, five seconds for... Condo. Are we, are we counting condo? It will be a no, and John has five more points. Mm -hmm. uh, you will be able to steal in the second round, which Ooh. is your... Last name Douglas. First name Buster. Buster Douglas, welcome. Skates. Fighter. Bottom of the line. Three seconds. One. Oh. Guys, Howard has five more points. He breaks the streak. After he hears this, he'll give us one word. You ready? Okay. Fallen angels. We ball from every angle. Rhymes. Awesome. Steel. Howard and JW. Old matchup. <laughs> Howard and JW. Double. Substance. Poetry. Ah. Uh, that was said already. Howard's got 10 points here. Commentator. Howard. Federation. John. Colorful. Yes, Giselle. Mexico. What a great round. He lives in Mexico half the year. Commentator. Giselle just won 30, 39 points as well. There are only four people that we are still going to be voting for for the second chance bowl. Well, we can make it five if JW gets 60 points tonight because he'll be in round number two of this tournament. Ooh. JW. Waynes. I already said that. Two, one. Waynes was said, guys and gals. 25 points to be allocated to Kelly White. Losing is not in my vocabulary. Tall. Basketball. Steel. Yeah. Julie and JW have stolen. Steel. Howard stole from John. Defense. Great defender. JW. I don't think defense was said. Guys Woo! and gals, hold on over here. You no, know, I, like I said, I came in here to just motivate one person and I ended up getting into the second round. Yeah, I'm not. I'm, I'm happy. Like, uh, one way or another, we'll meet. Yeah. And I'm going to put up 40. One. Still. John stole from Howard. John. Ooh. Victorious. Vince. Conventions. John. Steel. Ring. It's already been said. White is in round number three. Oh, I actually have to think if I want to do that because I don't know if Bagwell will make it to round three. I don't know how long it's going to take people to understand and watch the black box and damn thing, anything can happen, man. Wow. Anything can happen on the black box. Oh, wow. Let me I set see. this up for everybody, too. Guys, uh, what they're playing for. Our points so valuable because everybody wants to have an advantage in round two or three. Mm. And when you're playing for such points, you're earning it. You might be seeing celebrities on the black box really soon. And when I say might, I mean you will. Um, <laughs> after round Oof. number one is over, they uh, want some points. They want some advantages. You've got to win them. John Red made this place. Uh, already we've had four John Red challenges? Four? Yes. Three yeah. out of four, John is one. Three out of four. I'm thinking that an angry John Red is a good John Red, is a better John Red. Ooh. John Red, am I, am I right to say that this Wednesday night we're going to see a John Red like we've never seen before? I'm going to tell you what, man. I have been through the gauntlet, and anyone who's watched, has, have they have to give me my – I've done pretty well considering, you know, this isn't easy, but I know what I need to do. Just like everyone else, I'm getting a whole lot better at the John Red Challenge myself, you know? Yeah, but uh, John, you know, listen, pride, pride, pride of the prize. You know, the pride of losing, not a good thing. You know uh, you know, you always put a lot on the line. You have a, you're have you in round number three. I mean, so really, at the end of the day, you're one of only two, maybe three. Kelly White said he may not want to go to round three because he wants to face Buff Bagwell if that were to happen. Now, he has to play the odds on that because names are going to go in the bowl. We're going to have a special show dedicated to round number two when round number one is over very soon. And again, next week's lineup is insane as well. One of the greatest in his professions is going to be here. Um, when I pull out those names, that's how we're going to draw who faces who. There'll be triple threat matchups, so there'll be the number three card in the bowl. There'll also be a couple of four-way matchups. The number four will be in the bowl as well. The way it works is if I pick someone's face card, maybe Howard Collado's face card on that given night, if the next face card I pull up is of Mindy Red. They're not facing each other one-on-one. -on -one. I'm going to pull another card. And if it's a face card, it means it's one-on-one. -on -one. If it's a triple threat or a three-number or four-number, then it'll be others that they'll be facing. So it's essentially in order of the cards that I select. It's going to be a really fun show. Wow. A bevy of three awesome. cards will be in there. There'll be a lot of triple threat matchups. Guys, again, look, 109 is what we're... 109 Hall of Famers. 
for the yeah. world of sports and music, not to mention luminaries. And we're talking about individuals who have won or have been nominated for Oscars, Grammys, Tonys, Emmys, Golden Globe, AMA, WGA, and Olympians, all competing for the pride of the prize. That's what this thing is all about. Wednesday nights, 8 p.m. Eastern time. You want more green room? You want uh, only exclusive content that you can get on Joe Resort's page? Watch it. It'll be streaming everywhere pretty soon as well. Uh, let's talk more about what else was announced on Black Box really quickly. Yeah. I am going. I am not playing in these games. You know, sometimes people think, "Oh, yeah, it's great, it's great. I love this one. I love that one." I wish I could sit back and have mm-hmm. people direct questions to me. Mm. I wish I could. But you know what? The way it goes, I'm not complaining. But I'm in this tournament. I'm here to win, and I could say this as well. Even though I don't want points, I'm going to round two without any points, and that's fine. What I do want is to be able to defeat three people I looked up to uh. in a rap battle. And I announced it on Wednesday. It'll be myself versus, mm-hmm. yes, versus mm-hmm. Christopher Kid Reed, Christopher Play Martin, and Tretch from Naughty by Nature. Man. Never rap battle. Man. Never rap battle. Man. It's going to happen between round one and two. I, I, can't, I, I can't. I'm not going to do this for points. It's really, it's an unsanctioned match, if you will. It's about yeah, the pride. Yeah. It'll yeah. be elimination style. Four rounds. I will throw myself in the hat as the underdog. These three are legends in there. Howard? How do you prepare for that, Abby? How do you prepare I'll, for I'll that? Show you, I'll show you soon, but right now, yeah. right now, what I want to do, guys and gals, isn't just prepare for something. I need to recover from something. And we all need to recover from something. So I'm going to keep Howard on screen. And Howard is going to be on screen with a man who's looking sharp. Man who has always been very honest, always given us uh, his time and his heart and soul as well, gives us a lot to think about it when it comes to the world of recovery. So let's bring in Dion. Dion, Howard, I love what you guys did last week. Same man. There'll be some listening, hopefully. There'll be some good conversation. See how it flows. But Dion, welcome again to the green room. Hey, Dion. Avi, how are you? Can you hear me? Yo, Howard. Yes, Yes, I can hear you. Hey Dion, what, what can you, do you hear think me? So can you see show? me? You having a nice time watching the show thus far? Oh, it was absolutely amazing. Yes, absolutely. Every time, it's great. I really liked Mr. Jenkins. Was so moving. It was. Oh yeah. It was. Oh yeah. Big time. Well, you know, these conversations are moving too. So what I'm going to do is move, so that you guys can move, uh, and pull at people's heartstrings because you're talking about things that matter. Uh, let's talk a little bit about, I want to bring this up and Howard, Dion, they could, you guys can start whoever wants to jump in. Yeah. I want to talk about obstacles. What are some of the obstacles when you're in recovery as it pertains to friends you might've had? Have you ever had to lose friends because of their habits? Has it ever been tough to do so? If so, why? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Howard, go ahead. I, you know, I, I actually got emotional with that question. Thank you, Avi, again for this amazing opportunity. Um, you know, my first year, I dealt with, I think, what a lot of people in recovery or just as a human being uh, is challenging. Uh, I had to deal with a breakup, and then I also had to deal with a, uh, a loss, a death. And, uh, you know, I, obviously, I'm a musician, and, um, you know, there was a, a really good buddy of mine, uh, and I'll say his name, um, Javier, Javier Horta. A uh, beautiful man, awesome person. He was my drummer in my band. You know, he was my John Bonham. You know what I mean? And uh, you know, we played for years together. You know, and uh, loved the guy, loved the guy to death. But he was sometimes difficult to to work with. A lot of people revolve. You know, a lot of different lineup changes. Long story short, me and him did a lot of drinking together, a lot of drinking and drugging together. You know, the whole rock star thing. And at the tail end, um, you know, when I got sober. Um, you know, he was going through his own little dark, uh, so his own dark pathway. And um, that's when I broke my anonymity. I was like, brother, this is this is what I, I'm doing. And it was difficult because so much of my identity was wrapped around this whole, you know, musician rocker thing. Right. So you get sober. My question is, who the hell am I without that? Right. And that's scary. You know, for years, that's who I, you know, thought I, I was, right? This musician, actor, guy, and here's the kicker. Here's the funny thing. So I was the guy who would bring in the the eighteen pack, right? So I stopped. I would just bring in Snapples, 
one of the tools I learned is I would bookend my rehearsals. I'd call my sponsor before I get there and then call him after. So that was a really helpful tool. But what I realized is I was the one, I was the big drinker. You know what I mean? Like no one was like mm -hmm. alcohol when I didn't bring it. So to kind of get back on track with my buddy. Um, so he, you know, they talk about it being a program of, of um, uh, you know, you, 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 you become an example, right. As opposed to preaching it. Right. So he kind of mm -hmm. saw what I was doing and he started mm -hmm. seeing more of the changes in me. So I would just be like, Hey brother, if you want to come to a meeting with me, let me know. It's always open, but I would never push it. So long story short, he kind of started kind of getting his own, you know, sober days together. Right. Just started kind of accumulating his own time. And he was he started looking good. I was always telling him, hey, if you want to get into uh, the rooms with me, let me know. So long story short, uh, he's at three months sober. Right. He did New Year's Eve sober, which was like mind blowing to me. And one weekend he goes out and I get a text uh, from his uh, brother on Monday. He was like, have you seen Avi? And I was like, no, I, I haven't. So he ends up becoming missing for a week. Uh, it was on the news for a while and, you know, we're, we're looking for him and all that. And, you know, unfortunately uh, they found his body in uh, the Bronx river and um, oh. obviously it, you know, broke, broke my heart. Um, and it was one of the first times where I really realized like this disease definitely does want to kill you in a sense. Uh, and essentially what happened is, you know, he, he had accumulated three months of sobriety. He went out one night, so his, his tolerance had, had lowered, you know. So what normally would have been three or four beers, he would have been fine. Three or four beers or whatever knocked him out. So I had a great support group. Um, I had two of my sober friends who were like, I'm going to go with you to the wake. I was kind of shy to even ask. And that was one of the difficult things, uh, one of the obstacles to, to answer the question. Uh, Dion, uh and I'm sorry for your loss. Thanks, brother. I'm sorry for your loss as well. That's devastating. Does I, that, uh, that something that resonate with you as well, Dion? Right, right to the heart. Yeah, it got me a little. Um, <clears throat> I used to. Uh, I was. I played drums. Um, oh. I was okay. I was okay. We see me and my buddy and and this girl that turned out to be his wife later on. Mm -hmm. uh, we would live together like rock stars without money. So we would wake up at the crack of noon and hit the box of wine. And then we'd make, you know, we'd make our mixed drinks. It'd be a big glass of vodka, a little splash of Pepsi in it, and some Percocets and all that nonsense. I decided I'm, I'm going to die one day if I don't get out of here. So I needed to go and get help, and I did. And while I was gone, um, my guitar player, he uh, pistol whipped some guy and got five years in prison. And, sh and she sounded like Janis Joplin. You would have loved her. Mm. Her name was Carla. She... She drank herself to death, and she was mm -hmm. only, I think, 42, 43. Gotcha. So, yeah, it hits. You know, the obstacles are the path. When I decided to actually, act, when it was all over, when it was all said and done, mm -hmm. I had to I had to move. Um, I had to leave. I have to drop all my friends. I had to break up with my girlfriend. I had to I was a carpenter for 28 years. I could build a house by myself. Gotcha. I had to leave. That, I had to leave that profession. Yeah. Because your new life is going to be very expensive. It's going to cost you your old one. And mm -hmm. just like you said, it is, who am I even right now? You, you identify so much, so much with what you do and how you live. You forget that you're, everything is aside, all societal insistencies and all ideas you even had and were told or learned. You're a child of God. Mm -hmm. And when you see life through a spiritual lens, it's like, okay, you do with me what you will. Mm. Dion, go get help. You can't do this alone. You've been doing it now for over a decade. You can't. So go get help. It's surrender. Surrender to God as he expresses himself to you and through the people that come to you and say, you can't do that anymore. You can't be around that that energy anymore. But when something was comes gradual? up. Was it gradual for you, Dion? Uh, mine process, was in the process September. process of letting go. The process of letting go. Um, well, I lost my home. Um, well, yeah, I guess, about, I guess people it, specifically people that were around you that may have been a friend or may have been supportive at one point going through when something. I, when I, yeah. Go ahead. No, I'm sorry. Uh, when I, Please. 
when I went away and I went to uh, I went to a halfway house, I did the emergency room detox rehab halfway house. When I came back to town to Lorda, New Jersey, uh, where I am now, um, it was so funny. It was like the devil jumped up, uh, not so much in in temptation form. The guys I used to do dope with and pills with, they pulled up right in front of the place where I was just coming out of the library. I love the library. And they're like, hey, Dion. And dude had like a little bottle of Percocet or Oxycontin Maracas. Hey, dude, what's going on? So without even thinking, they're in the car. I did this. Hey, guys, listen, I got popped. I'm hot. These are my boys. I don't want you. If they're watching me, they're going to watch you. I didn't finish the sentence. They were gone. I seen them a couple of years ago. They still drive by doing this. It's like when they drove away, I felt two things at the same time. Let me know, Howard, if you if you could relate. I felt sure. sad, sad because I just burned that bridge. And mm-hmm. when you're in a pretty small town, it gets around fast. Dion's hot. You know, yeah, he yeah. didn't rat, but he's hot. Stay away from. Him. And at the same time, I felt like, wow, I really do have a brand new chance, a brand new life. Mm. You get a second, you get it. Why well, have a, a hundred and second chance all the times I fell out? But I want to invite do. Dion. A yeah, I want to invite you to our Wednesday show too. I want to be able to do more uh, when you're free, of course, if you're free. Uh, Wednesday mm-hmm. show, F- Saturday and Wednesday, more recovery talk with Howard and myself and Dion. Uh, by the way, you did mention uh, Lodi, Lodi, US 46. Um, yes, sir. I love Lodi, New Jersey. Absolutely. Uh, a lot of cool stuff there in Lodi. Uh, listen, hey, Howard and, and Dion, what I want to do is get some artwork for the show or for this segment, I should say. We're going to yeah. come up with a title for this segment. It's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of heart that goes into it. We're going to make sure that those flyers are also going to be all over social media or Facebooks and whatnot. And it'll be a segment that will have its own name. It'll also appear on the black box. Recovery talk is very, very important. And you guys are very important. And you guys are always honest and truthful. And we're going to take this thing uh, step by step and see where it goes. Because a lot of people probably bear their souls when they hear how honest you guys are as well. So, Thanks for that, Avi. Thanks for that Absolutely. opportunity, man. Thank Appreciate you so that. much. Wednesday, I'll be there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Guys, more recovery talk for not sure. only Wednesday, but next Saturday with Dion as well. So this Wednesday and next Saturday. We got more Dion. Dion, you, uh, you got a little Christopher Reed vibe going on tonight. Oh, thank I don't know why. you. I it feel might, it might be the new dude that he's got. He's got the <laughs> new dude. Yeah, I like it. I like it. It's definitely fresh. Uh, but my friend, again, thank you for what you do. Guys, again, the YouTube channel. Dion has a YouTube channel. A lot of great stuff and a lot of great content on there. I will promote it, continue to plug it, uh, and really make sure that you guys listen to the messages that he provides because they're very honest and truthful and Sometimes raw, and not many people have the courage to to go down that rabbit hole the way he does. So thanks again for sharing everything that you do, Dion. Thank you, thank you Howard, for sharing. Avi, thank you for your time, man. Thank you for everything. We're going to see you on Wednesday, my friend. Definitely. Thanks again. Absolutely. Here, brother. That's Dion, guys and gals. Uh, we're in a three, oh, if we weren't at three hours and 13 minutes. <laughs> yeah, I could. More. Let's bring in everybody. Let's bring in Papa Red. Giselle, truly, Julie. Uh, I'm not going to do this tonight, but guys, I'm going to hype it up. We'll have a flyer for this too, for the battle. Next Saturday night, I'm going to give you a sample. I'm talking to you guys. Mm. You didn't play and stretch. Mm. I'm going to give you a sample live next Saturday night, March 30th. Oh, oh. hell yeah. March. Hell yeah. I'm going to give you something right now, guys and gals. A little bit of a taste, but that's it. Ooh. That's it. It's just going to be a little bit of a taste of what I got. Okay. okay. Hell yeah. Yeah. Howard, a little beat. Just One, a little yeah, beat. yeah, yeah. I hit it. A little lower, Howard. You always go a little higher. Too much the In the 80s, I came from the struggle. I wear it like a badge. I don't budge. We're definitely friends, but when I soak you, you might hold a grudge. As all you'll deliver will be smudge, like kids not named Charlie in a factory requesting some fudge. That's all I got for now. But guys and gals and pals, <laughs> there'll be more. So that is for keep playing stretch. Bring it, guys. Bring it. I was all ears on that. <laughs> I want to be all ears about the following as well because, guys, Women's Month. Very important to talk about some of the individuals that have done so much in society. Uh, Giselle, there's someone in particular you want to bring up. Am I right? There is. It is a scientist this week, and she was almost lost to history, but... She is not, and that is exciting, and we need to know about her. I first learned about her about three years ago, and 
She had a very short life, but very instrumental. And her name is Alice Augusta Ball. And she is most well known for discovering a treatment for Hansen's disease, which I believe most people still know as leprosy. Okay. Wow. So, yes, yes. Miss wow. Ball was born July 24th, 1892 in Seattle, Washington. Wow. Spent time growing up in Seattle and Hawaii. She has two older brothers, one younger sister. Her family was considered middle and upper middle class. Why would mm. that be unusual? Well, they are black. Mm. So think about that. Late 1800s, early 1900s. Wow. An African American, a black family on the West Coast. What drove, what some people surmise drove her love for chemistry is the influence she had from her grandfather and father on photography. Oh, wow. Her father was a newspaper editor, photographer, and lawyer. And her grandfather, James Bell Sr., was a famous photographer who was one of the first African Americans to learn to daguerreotype. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. She huh. graduated Seattle High School in 1910. She studied chemistry at the University of Washington, earned her bachelor's in pharmaceutical chemistry in 1912. Two years later, earned another degree in pharmacy. So that's 1914. Interesting. So what motivated her to um, want to discover this this cure for leprosy? Did she have somebody in her family? Did she have it? She did not, um, nor do we know if anyone in her family did. None of that has been confirmed, but she, she studied a lot of properties of different oils and extracting them to create the compounds. And this is what gave her the idea. So she was studying Shalmugra, C-H-A-U-L-M-O-O-G-R-A, Shalmugra oil and its properties. And she was able to make this oil injectable because previously it was topical, but it would leave blisters on people's skin. Mm -hmm. And there were oral treatments with the oil as well before mm -hmm she discovered these properties and that would make people vomit. So what did this oil do? Was this going to help with first two questions? What was it called again? What was, what is the disease called that is also known as leprosy? What was that called again? Hansen's disease. Hansen's disease. Yes. I don't remember the exact year that was renamed, but. Got it. Yeah. And and as oil helped connect it. Like, <laughs> help with the cure of so I, i'm an essential oils person so that fascinates me that essential oils was connected to now known as leprosy yeah so it's from the the shalmugra tree and she discovered the ester ethyl form which made it water soluble which made it able to be dissolved in the blood which made it injectable yeah. So just the so injected instead of like a roll-on type oil, this was more we use with a needle, but it's an essential type oil. Right, because the topical treatments would leave blisters on people's arms. So not only did they have the marks from Hansen's disease, they would have these blisters and sores from the treatments. Oh man, so double whammy. Right. <laughs> yeah, insult to injury, but I'm I'm just wondering too, like who did she um test this on first? Do you have that information? I'm just kind of curious because I know things transgress and we first know somebody that has it and then it and motivated. I mean, it's just very fascinating to know the progress of a cure. Sure. So this is great because she went to the University of Hawaii. It was then called the College of Hawaii. Now it's the University first, of Hawaii. The first, uh, the first woman. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. For her oh, wow. master's degree. And That's she was cool. the first woman and the first African American to wow. receive her master's degree from the University of Hawaii. She had published an article with her undergrad with the help of her pharmacy instructor, a 10 page article 
Benzylations and Ether Solution in the and Journal I, of I'm American not mistaken, Chemical. That you, just read, you just read it, yeah, the Journal yeah. of American Chemical Society. Mm -hmm. You know what's really sad is that she never lived to witness the results of her discoveries. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, she died very young. She made these uh, discoveries when she was 23, and unfortunately she passed cow. away the very next year when she was 24. Oh, from wow. 24, 24. No. Oh, no. They actually don't know. There are some theories on how she passed away, but it is yeah. unknown. Some of it I might think. Be. I think if you uh, what 85, wow. 85 years, she's lost in the pages of time. Mm -hmm. She's really Great lost. Um, you know, guys. Again, this is. Uh, we'll do much more of this because I want to be able to delve deeper uh, when it comes to not just this particular topic, but really when it comes to recovery, when it comes to celebrating mm -hmm. some of the unsung heroes in society. We're going to continue doing that. Uh, thank mm -hmm. you again for that, guys. That was Giselle. Mm -hmm. uh, we might have some topics, John, Howard, Mindy, some next week. We'll always have our own little corner of sure. topics that we bring up. John? I was just saying, you know, it's it's amazing that what she was able to accomplish back in that time, not only being a woman, but a black woman mm -hmm. in that time to, to yep. have such a big impact on the world. And, you know, we never know how long we're going to be on the earth. Mm -hmm. And we all are here for a reason. And we have to figure out what that reason is and make our contribution to society. Hell yeah. She made her contribution to the world and yeah. died a year later. We just never yeah. know how long lasting this all will be. Well, you know, and I hate to agree with something John is saying, but I do want to piggyback off of something he said, though, as much That's as I hate to agree with him. But I want to piggyback because sometimes we don't, and I'm sure just like she didn't get to see the results of her hard earned work and her research and everything sometimes we're not going to see the results of our our love and our passion and what we put into people mm -hmm. and so even though we're not going to always get to see the results that doesn't mean we stop doing what we love doing and what no, our passion no. is just like with her she didn't get to see how her injectable is helping so many people mm -hmm. but it didn't stop her it didn't no stop her no she did no. She, we talked about it earlier she did it because she knew that she was going to make a difference. And at the end of the day, that's your legacy. And the people who have legacies that are very deep and rich don't even know they're going to have legacies usually. They're doing yeah. it. They're so mm -hmm. focused on the task at hand. Guys, speaking of the task at hand, it's always our task to remind you to share, to like, to subscribe. It's free. Our YouTube channel. Our YouTube channel at The New Network. Very easy to find. The New Network. Guys and gals and pals, in a week's time, as I... Delivering an aside. <laughs> Guys and gals, I'm about to tell Howard, Mindy, Julie, Giselle, and John to timestamp this. <clears throat> Give me a second. <clears throat> Are you <clears throat> coughing? Okay. Time. Yes, uh, that was a coffee. <clears throat> <clears throat> you okay? I will be. If you shut up. <laughs> um, guys and gals and gals. <laughs> in a week's time, 2.4 thousand new subscribers. Subscribe mm. to the new network on YouTube. Get what I just said. In a week's time, yeah, two point four thousand. Julie is working her butt off back there. So am I. So is everybody here. Two point four thousand new subscribers. Wow, Again, man. this video says it all. Woo. I'm excited. Who do I want to be tomorrow? The guy that oh. quit, or no. the guy that kept going? The guy that took the easy option, or the guy that went all in? Stays on his feet, airs it out down the field. It is caught. Back out to Hamlin. History title. Bang! Oh, good! Yeah. Oh, Jenkins. 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 Oh,
We can dig deep and discover, and we can truly be immune to negativity and strife. So even if there's a boat, guys and gals, that you're on, and it might tip, we can get a grip and build our own ship. Nightclub with energy and, <laughs> and music, and I am ready to. Yeah, yeah. You know what? Yes. You know what? How about this? Opening night, I'll be raps. There you go. <laughs> at last count, at last, exactly. count, at last count, our YouTube channel is actually it's... at twenty-seven point nine. We're close to twenty thousand. Wow. wow, that's, guys. that's live awesome. right there. I'm pulling up live. Awesome. So we surpassed what we I am so extremely happy. I mean, God. Oh. Uh oh. Here we go. Oh. 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 <laughs> Explain another question. Y'all know what you know. You're referred to as the Green Rumors. You read the final page. You smiled wide as you put the book back on its shelf. The first chapter ended, but there's only one issue. The pen keeps writing, and in late April you will see my face. And once you do, you can rest assured that there will be no mystery when it comes to your history. <laughs> concerned that that was a picture of a lake? But, uh, you know, damn, are we going to we go here again? Are we going here again? I'm sure Mindy's happy. Don't speak for me. I don't, I don't need you to speak for me. Mr. Klein? Don't know. Uh, what's next? Well, I don't know what's next, guys. Hey, the lake's over. See, season one of the lake is gone. It's behind us. We got nothing to worry about. The lake, lake, celebrity grand tournament is what it's all about. Yeah, 
Yeah. We don't have yeah. to concern ourselves with that. That that. No. Order. I don't even have a pen in this office anymore. No. Uh, no writing utensils. Nothing. Maybe not on Saturday nights, but there's still a season two being written. Season two of the late guys and gals. Uh, okay. All I know is that Clay Brick Stevens is, is going to show us who he is in April. That's what I do know. I don't know if I want to see now. Yeah, I, I, not sure how I feel about that. What? How about yeah. the old lake, John Red? Where? Abby, it was such a good night, man. It was such a good night. Tell me about Everything the lake, John. was. It really John, was. Tell me, John. Look, the lake. I thought we were past it, and I guess if we're honest with ourselves, I guess we're never gonna be past it. The lake. <laughs> It, it was just a. It was. It was a series. It was. It was fun time. So was. We, we did some great. Season one. Clay's story getting a little sentimental. Not. He watched it. Maybe he binge watched it or something. Guys, the lake. Does it ever leave us? I don't know. What I do know, guys and gals, is that at three hours and thirty-two minutes, there's something else that's next. They should cheer you up. It's not about the who or the what or the where or the when or the why or the how. about the now our now begins in a second and in a second from now we're going to find out who is next in this celebrity grand tournament that's been filled to the brim with some of the best in their fields guys and gals and pals in this video of who's next not one maybe two maybe two individuals in this video will be in the tournament Ooh. At the 11th hour of round number one, at the 11th hour, round number one's ending. In this video, you might be seeing two people that will be appearing in round number one of this tournament at the 11th hour. Nice. Right at the end, at the shank. So, guys, awesome. we know what this is. We know where it is. We know when it is. <laughs> we know how it's done. Some of you do. But who is Stop telling you what to do. Maybe I ought to kick your ass. No, we don't want to do this. You taught me as much as I ever taught you. Dad, could yeah. you hold still, please? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Just uh, you know, I, I just I just wanted to tell you that I, I really appreciate you coming all the way out here to see me get this award. Not now, Dad. Well, I just want you to know how much it meant to me. I know, but. When you talk, your Adam's apple keeps bobbing up and down, and I can't tie the stupid bow tie. Oh, sorry. <laughs> See you around, partner. Are you sure about this, Mike? Look, I'm not going back to wallow in self-pity, okay? I just want to live out there for the reason I was going out there for in the first place. Which is? To fish. Dominoes <laughs> falling. I never Yeah, yeah, Vera read uh, Women's Magazine over the weekend. Uh, article says uh, you got to put romance back in the marriage. Oh, you're a chat. Yeah. She says, uh, she says uh, I got to act like recording, right? I got to uh, call her up for a date, buy her flowers, take her someplace fancy. Well, that sounds good. Yeah, I'm romantic, guys. So I go down to the corner, use the payphone, call her up. She turns me down. <laughs> uh, 
And your error, Mr. Tilney, is easily forgiven. But I know something of a woman in a man's profession. Yes, by God, I do know about that. That is enough from you, Master Kent. Ducks in, draws everybody in on him. Barkley with a three. Oh, he feels it. They're fronting David Robinson once they get it in. Now Barkley challenged it. He gets up. The defender can't get there. Here's Barkley, the seventh steal. Benny Del Negro can't intercept. basketball or football players and then we started a weightlifting team and a couple of guys said man you ought to join us some Sunday night we go up and do this wrestling thing and I said I never even cared about it especially in those years you didn't you didn't have uh, your your range of uh, styles you didn't have a lot to choose from a baby face did it this way and a heel did it this way Two. Yes. Mm, lots of options. Two. We lots saw options. them. Wow. Maybe two. I said maybe, but definitely Ooh. one, but maybe two. Uh, guys, we still ending round one with a bang. We're ending round one with a bang. It is going to yeah. be a monster of a finale when it comes to the end of round number one. Julie, your thoughts? Uh, I'm just speechless, honestly. Why? Why are you speechless? Because there's so much. There's so much to look forward to. I can't wait for round two. It's going to be amazing with the promotions and seeing who's matched up against who. And uh, uh, it's just so much. Hang on, Avi. I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. Tonight literally blew my mind. Are you trying to tell me that there's a chance we could top tonight before the oh. end of round one? Well, I think that we're going to probably top the end of round number one, not so much just because of the luminaries, but besides for the names and faces you just saw, the consistency. That's what's going to blow people away, is that we're not going to stop. This thing is not going to stop. Thank you, guys, because, again, I, I can tell you right now, they're calling us, right? I mean, they, they see it on screen a lot of them. They're calling us. They're, they're finding out what this thing is. They're coming to us right now, some of the biggest names, and, again, what they represent, what they stand for, that is pretty damn cool. Uh, we are now at 109 Hall of Famers from the world of music, pro wrestling, not to mention sports. And, of course, 
Oscar, Grammy, Tony, Emmy, Golden Globe, <laughs> AMA, WGA, and Olympians all competing for the pride of the prize. Guys and gals, age is about the size. It's about the quality that we have here, the substance as well. Uh, man, oh, man, Howard Collado, your thoughts real quick. You know, what is such a special treat is tonight we saw a glimpse of who these, you know, amazing competitors were. Not just their accolades, not the, just their achievements, but who they are as people. And that's what I look forward to every day. You know, we, we come on the Saturday night. So imagine those individuals we just saw those in, in that video. I mean, mm -hmm. any one of them, I would love to learn more about mm -hmm. any one of those competitors. Yeah. So. Well, which one in particular, Howard? Sure. Oh, uh, Judy. I mean, Judy Dench, I would love to learn more about just her life, you know, just an amazing storyteller, but I'm sure even more so an amazing human being that I would just love to learn more. I mean, like, what was she like as a kid, right? What made her go into storytelling? Um, what's something that she doesn't maybe share with a lot of people? Um, right. That's, you know, that's what we learn here, you know, every Saturday night, uh, uh, what, what, you know, they don't always talk about maybe in those, you know, interviews where they even come here and they're like, hey, we always get asked the same talking points. Yeah. I always talk about the same talking points here. They really are able to share all their, you know, all those little things that they just don't talk about. And right. I think that's what gets me. Yeah. Who they are as people. And, you know, they're taken out of these boxes yes. that a lot of these other platforms maybe might put them in. Right. Yeah. And, and that's the, but yes, they put them yeah. in the box of you know, you're a comedian, let's be funny. Yeah. Or, you know, you're a baseball player, we talk baseball and mm -hmm. they get to be more than that here. You know, they get to be human beings that have passions and hobbies and families and loss. They don't get to talk about that kind of stuff no. everywhere else, but they get to here. They get to be human beings here at mm -hmm. TKN. And that's, that's what it's all about. Don't you agree, Julie, that the conversations that we're getting to have with human beings, allowing them to be real. Yeah, 100%. Um, every single week, I learn something new, and it's from a human being. I think we go into this knowing it's a celebrity tournament, right? We know it's a celebrity, the largest celebrity online network on the planet right we have so many we just said 109 and i think actually we should make a song to the 101 graph we already I, mean, I think we need a little ditty to it um but um yeah every every week i i take a look at these people and i and i see okay singer songwriter actor storyteller wrestler and it, it starts to fade away as i listen to them and open my my ears and my heart and, and really listen to them mm -hmm. communicating and having that conversation with us each and every week. John Lovitz, I've seen him as a it's comedian. And that, I love sitting, seeing him sitting on his couch. It could he be just, a couch in any any room, right? He just text me this right now. He just texted me this live three minutes ago. Wow. Uh, I was reading this about Ferguson Jenkins. Would you mind sending it over to him? He mm. said, you want his number? He said, can I? Yes. And then he wrote down again. Love what you guys do tonight. This was incredible. Uh -huh. Haven't met a host like you before. Was in shock. Didn't know what to expect. This far exceeded mm. my expectations. That's from John wow. live here. Yeah. Guys, uh, that's, what it's about. that's yeah. amazing. That's like, and then you even get to happens, see you take your hair down. What happens is, you know, speaking to them the next day or the next night or Tuesday and Wednesday, there's more. That's what I'm saying. There's more. And that's when you hear the Mark Henrys and you hear the Jason Londons and Jeremy London and Stephen Tobolowskis and Jacques Rougeau's, it's because friendships are being fostered here. These are people right. I still talk to. Mm -hmm. during the week even when there's new arrivals coming in so mm. we're, we're building something really strong we want you guys and gals to still be a part of it uh not everyone is going to be a part of this thing physically but uh internally they will be this video is for said person mm -hmm.
Uh, uh, dear friend who we lost, no one, even the cast knows who I'm talking about. We've never seen this person in the green room before or TKN. Uh, the conversation was recorded last year. There's a bevy of conversations, not interviews, that have been in my external hard drive for quite some time because we've been doing round one of this tournament. But those conversations will there, including this very final conversation with a very, very, very special human being who I've known for a while but got to know through the process of uh, of this tournament. He was set to be in the tournament. We lost Tom Sizemore as well, so we know it's not Tom. But uh, yeah, yeah. it's definitely something we haven't seen, and it's going to be one hell of a conversation that we had. Wish we had more that we recorded. It's about 90 minutes worth. Hope you all enjoy it. It was very, very deep and very, very profound and very, very honest as well. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate that comment. Uh, a lot lot going on here in TKN World. Who, Who is Clay Brick Stevens? Hmm. Who is Clay Brick Stevens? Will Kelly White on Wednesday decide whether or not he'll be voting or at least uh, advancing to round number three? It's his call. Only Giselle and John Red are there. More videos. Speaking of Giselle, round three. Speaking of Truly Julie and her journey, uh, we're going to have her video as well. Mindy, John Red, Howard Collado. A video every Saturday night. It's going to be amazing. More recovery talk with Dion. We know that Sally, Jesse Raphael, we also know that John Lovitz and, of course, the amazing Ferguson Jenkins and Fergie, all in round number three as we voted live. Voting will return to normal next week, guys. We'll return to normal. You'll be voting after each topic. Uh, the intro might be a bit longer with more and more content as well. It's going to be a lot of fun to be able to take that in. Uh, there's so much. Again, we have the McKenna versus Kelly White mm. matchup. That's going to happen in the black box. Uh, there's a lot. The second chance bowl voting. I will probably do it either Wednesday or next Saturday. Definitely by next Saturday. Ooh. More voting. Five names now. Since JW advanced, five names remaining. Eric Roberts is still on the board. Rock Richards is still on the board. Lila yep. Robbins is still on the board. Uh, gosh, the Matt Stuntman's on the board. Anson Williams is still on the board. Cindy Pickett could still be voted back to the second chance bowl. Uh, mm-hmm. There's just a bevy of names. I'm probably leaving a few out as well that were just incredible. Jeff Timmons. Yeah. Jeff Mark Timmons. Hero. Jeff Timmons is another one. Uh, there's and so Patera. many. So Peter Melman. Yeah. And Patera, Stan Hansen, they're on yeah, the board. Peter Melman. Peter Melman. Yeah. Peter Melman. Uh, guys, this has been an incredible, incredible Green Room episode. Yeah. Please oh, yeah. go to YouTube and comment. Those comments help us out. Comment as many times as you want on our YouTube videos. Get the word out because we are changing something. We're definitely not ordinary. And I'd like to say that because of you, we're extraordinary. Uh, we want to keep doing what we're doing. Next Saturday night, guys, if you watch this outro... You'll get a sneak peek as to who might be on next Saturday. As of a few days ago, only two. As of yesterday, back to three. Three. Three luminaries will be on live. And remember, take this in. On one night, live, on a Saturday, no less, in an evening, we learned about Ferguson Jenkins, John Lovitz, and Sally Jesse Raphael, all in one evening. Crazy. <laughs> Insane. Very amazing. Insane. <laughs> Blown away. Yeah. Bobby, can I ask you a question really quickly? No, no, not really. No, you can't. Of course. <laughs> How important it is to you for you to debrief with them after they've been on? It's a great question. Important. Luckily, mm-hmm. they take the pressure away from me and they contact me first. And say, <laughs> I had a great time or this was great or this was fun. So they, they do that first, and I think that's kind of what makes this whole process even more enjoyable is the conversations after the fact. Mm. You guys, you'll be seeing the green rumors that you're looking at right now, having conversations with these See. luminaries as well. Uh, that's coming up real, real soon, actually, so that'll be fun. I yeah. want the cast to uh, take in this awesome outro because if it doesn't pump you up, you're not human. If it doesn't pump you up, you shouldn't be here. If it doesn't pump you up, this outro, guys, this is not – pomp and circumstance this is real you heard mark henry last week right he looked in the camera and said i'm here to win this thing and he wasn't even competing last week <laughs> every one of these people every one of these luminaries want to win john lovitz mm-hmm. ferguson jenk they want to win they want to this win. thing mm-hmm. only one will win this thing mm-hmm. could be john could be howard could be mindy could be julie could be giselle mm-hmm. i plan on doing so myself it, one person one never can you pack as much star-studded talent mm-hmm. And qualified competitors in one place, John Red. Bobby, you, you might have slipped up a while ago, but I could have swore I heard you say fifteen thousand dollars mm-hmm. on the prize. Did I, did I say fifteen? Mm-hmm. 
I do know the pot. I'm not sure it was a slip up. We all know that that purse is going to increase, and I'm I'm just wondering is that a slip up or have we actually had that prize to go up to fifteen thousand? More, more will be announced after round number one. So, guys and gals and pals, for Howard Collado, for Dion, for Papa Red, for Truly Julie, Mindy Red, Giselle, Sally, Jesse, Raphael, John Lovitz. <laughs> And Ferguson Jenkins, I'm Avi Klein. Your top 10, one of you voted for your oh. favorite, as you do every week, mm. and some others as well. Enjoy, get inspired. And at the very end of the video, you'll get a bit of a hint as to who might be coming on next Saturday night live, 8 p.m. Eastern time. Mm. Enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. Nice. Obsession's gonna be talent every time. You got all the talent in the world, but are you obsessed? Is it all you ever think about? Mm. Really wanting to be the manager of distribution and product support services. Mm. I feel like hard work pays off! Perry Oklahoma, stand up! more or less mastered the entire professional wrestling field. St. Patrick's Day is celebrated in America the most, but it brings families together, not just one parade in one city. Every single city throughout the U.S. has a St. Patty's Day parade. There are many people, many film stars, who return to the stage and to the craft because they don't care about being famous. They want to be good. It a little bit. They sang it at the end of the album, and it's kind of like a revelation that there was somebody deeper there than you might imagine. He's hardcore. He's hardcore. He's hardcore. Everybody thinks that, and and you and we all say we don't judge people, but we do. We judge people that have different values than us. Whenever he would till the garden or whenever he would till the fields and all that, you know, me and being a twin, you know, I was always on one side of him and Jeremy was always on the other side of him. Who uh, put the keg way out here in the woods? I don't know. Uh -uh. So all the stuff that has to do with sports because the band has to be with the sports. So let's get the band a new bus along with the football stadium and the football buses and all of this stuff. How did I go from the verge of hot Floridian sex with Brandy to man of still coital debates with you in the food court? Mm. Your team, you're going to need your family. You're going to need your fans. They'll all be there to help support you. Trevor in the air, deep right field. There needs to be debates like this between people from different walks of life, or how would there ever be any resolution? Two times by Mark Henry. And the reason why you have to be consistent, as I always say, the sweat is my sweet, is because consistency leads to something a little bit more accurate in your day.
unfortunately for Muhammad, he had to give up his career, his lifeline, to go to prison for something he truly, truly believed in. They so called say it to be physical and aggressive out on the floor, and some people can handle it and some can't. These and cues, have your head on a swivel. Make sure you know where your surroundings are. Make sure you know where people are. Hardaway backs off on top. What a move! Oh, did he explode and it go? Over decades of work, to give an identity to everything that children need to learn. I hope some of the youngsters hearing that uh, bill will take note. Uh, I think if he came, then inevitably I'd hang out with Dean Martin, which would be great. Hi, I'm John Anderson of ESPN Sports Center. It just reminds people, like, even though you go through a struggle, you stay consistent, keep fighting and grinding it out, that things will be okay. And we'll start off with the offensive line. I'm sure you're familiar with the left side already. So, of course, he takes the two boxes of the raisins, rips the top off the raisins, and goes Phew. And listen, Harvey, no mistakes. Mm. One mistake and you'll be out Ben and Pretzels on 48th Street. <laughs> you know, my life is not going to change one way or another, but I know we're making an impact. Education is so important. But once I decided I was going to come back, you know, it was, you know, full bore head. They became a team, and one of his lines was, great moments are born from great opportunities. Just like Axis, you can't get me. Grabbed me and told me that to stand up for myself. And basically, that was the start of my boxing career. I think if uh, I had to ask, you know, some historical person, and that, that person would be Dr. King. First, the real deal, Dangerous Dan Spivey, Mean Mark Callis. You know, human rights and just being treated, you know, fairly is, is the thing that Malcolm and Martin Luther King talked about all the time. The fire of Scott. It's the guy who's willing to die who's going to win that itch. And I know if I'm going to have any life in you got to look at the guy next to you. Look into his eyes. Now, I think you're going to see a guy who will go that inch with you. You know what? Maybe one of the world's problems will get solved by listening to this show. Life, I, I'll be. I'm going to win this whole thing. Watch. I know you are, Tom. I know you are. There will be three, guys. There will be three. Not two, but three. Wow. We got our flyer starting Wednesday. A third person will be added to that flyer, or third. And Chat Top 10 resumes next week again. Have a great day.